I will begin by welcoming people to the 177th meeting of the New York State Board for Historic Preservation at Lovely Planting Fields Arboretum, State Historic Park, Oyster Bay, New York. Uh, we are not going to do the roll call to begin, but I welcome everyone and I thank Bob and Kai for inviting us to this beautiful site. Do we want to do the introduction now? Um, so, um, Bob, thank you for getting us here. Yeah, really. And uh, uh, I just want everyone on the state board to know that, that Long Island is cooler in the summer <laughs> and warmer in the winter. And uh, we hope you all come back uh, soon. We have Suffolk County, which begins a few miles from here, has more national register, register sites than any other county in the state other than New York County. So it all began here, and please come back soon. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. As, as folks, well, folks on Long Island know Bob in, in many capacities <laughs> and over a very long period of time. That is also true for upstate New York. Uh, Bob served as chair of this um, state review board for 23 years uh, and made the trek uh, generally to Albany for our quarterly meetings and the uh, accomplishments of the National Register Program uh, staff and, and program at, at our office. Um, number one in the nation in terms of number of listings, uh, number one in the nation in terms of aggregate number of structures. That's under your tenure, so we so thank you for that. Um, so uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, those in the room who are joining us today. Uh, Dina Wooters, Executive Director of Planning Fields Foundation. Uh, Vincent Simeone, uh, Director of Planning Fields Arboretum uh, for OPRHP. Uh, and Michael Rumpel, Assistant Director of Planning Fields Arboretum. Um, Bob McCoy is here, Hal Davidson, welcome, sir. Uh, Constance Haydock. And then we know we have uh, a signaling intention to come, and I haven't seen all of you yet this morning, so I apologize. Uh, Brian Irwin, uh, Long, Island, Long Island State Park Commissioner. Lorraine Gilligan, Director of Preservation at Old Westbury Gardens. Uh, Nancy Kostopoulos, uh, President and CEO of Old Westbury Gardens. Uh, Alex Wolf, Executive Director of Preservation Long Island. Hello, Alex. Eric Kautz, also with Preservation Long Island, Director of Preservation. Karen Kennedy, Consultant, and uh, Jonathan Hyman uh, with the Pusat Dark Foundation. Welcome, sir. So, um, and then our, in our staff, um, we have Kath uh, uh, Frank, who heads our NR unit, Bill Prattinger, uh, sitting to the back there, Jen Wilkowski. Uh, Virginia Bartos uh, and Beth Cumming is here along with uh, Olivia Prissy. Um, and finally, let me introduce our newest State Review Board member, um, Carol. Uh, we thank you greatly um, for knowing our office as Ms. Quorum. Um, <laughs> we have uh, several vacancies on the board. We've had long-standing pending uh, confirmations uh, through, uh, uh, and, and Carol was the first to come through. We're very pleased to have your expertise and deep experience with historic preservation nationally and in New York State to inform this board's work. So thank you. Very it's much. my pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. Great. Thank you. Very good. And I think that's it for introductions. All right. Uh, as is our custom, we'll go around the room here and I'll ask the board to introduce themselves. Uh, I'm the chair of the State Review Board. Uh, my position on the board is that of an archaeologist. I believe the board composition requires two archaeologists on the staff and I serve one of those roles. I'm a past board member. I'm a clinical assistant professor at the University of Buffalo and grew up in, in extreme western New York. Uh, I'm also the president of the New York Archaeological Council and uh, very happy to be here today. And I'm Catherine Frank and I'm the National Register Coordinator and I'm sitting up here because I'm the secretary to the board. Okay. Uh, I'm Jay DiLorenzo. I'm the president of the Preservation League of New York State. Um, and. Doug, maybe you should say you grew up in far western New York instead of extreme. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm Carol Clark. I'm an adjunct professor at Columbia University in Historic Preservation, and I work full time as a director for the city's Department of Design and Construction in New York. I'm Kristen Heron. I'm the program director for architecture and design and museums at the New York State Council on the Arts. I serve as the proxy representative for our chair, Catherine Nichols. I'm Wynne Aldrich. Uh, I was for quite a number of years the representative on this board of the State Department of Environmental Conservation.
conservation. Then I served for many four years for, as Deputy Commissioner for Historic Preservation and so sat back there. Uh, and for the last uh, four or five years, I guess, I've been a member of this board and I think I fill one of the history slots in the board. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I'm so old, but because I know the little history. Mm -hmm. I'm Erica Krieger. I'm a, an assistant director at the Department of State Division of Building Standards and Codes. I am an architect, so I think I'm filling that spot, but I am here uh, representing, uh, filling the slot of the uh, Secretary of State. And I'm Daniel McKay. I serve as Deputy Commissioner for Historic Preservation and Deputy State Preservation Officer. Uh, and oversee the work of the Division for Historic Preservation uh, for OPRHP. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Gina Waters, Executive Director of Planning Fields Foundation. Good morning. Um, I'd like to ask you to join me as well. We're going to be just giving you a brief introduction to Planting Fields and really uh, touching up on, on some of the current initiatives that Planting Fields Foundation and New York State are working on together. So, I'm just going to stand over here because the range yep. uh, doesn't work so well. So, um, I thought I'd just start with the mission of the Planting Fields Foundation. And, uh, and the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. And hopefully as we go through this, this uh, short presentation, you'll be able to see how we're meeting all of these objectives. And both of the missions are really very well aligned. So um, I only joined the organization at the beginning of this year. It's really been a pleasure and privilege to work closely with New York State, with Vinny and Michael, and uh, exceptional board of trustees and staff. And uh, exciting to really just think about the next chapter for planning fields and uh, continue the excellence that already is here. Yeah, so I have been here 27 and a half years, a few years, and so when I first came here, there wasn't a lot of cooperation, there wasn't a lot of, you know, things were going, things were moving, but they weren't moving necessarily in the right direction. I think over the last 20 years, we have definitely been moving in a, in a positive direction, and there's been a lot more cooperation, a lot more communication between state parks and the foundation and all the support organizations that are around us. And so there's been a renaissance here at Planning Fields because of that, with a lot of that cooperation, a lot of funding, state funding and foundation funding working together. So this is a, a, a aerial of the of the arboretum, probably, Chris, what would you say, the mid to late 20s or so? I think it's maybe 24. Okay, so there you go. And, um, you know, it obviously shows this iconic place and, and in its glory, in its, in its prime. And uh, you know that's one of the reasons why we're doing a cultural landscape report now to sort of get back to some of this grandeur and some of the elements that have been uh, lost or are need to get, get re, uh, you know recaptured. Uh, we have over the last 20 years recaptured a lot of the landscape back and have you know worked on doing that. And you can kind of see some of the comparisons here. And we have uh, incredible the foundation has an incredible archive here, so we have a lot of material to pull from. Uh, the the uh, state has the Robert Moses archive uh, here, so we have that to pull from. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the photographic archives are amazing. So, um, you know, it is a very iconic place. We have one of the best plant collections uh, probably in the country. And we have, of course, a lot of beautiful artifacts and, and a wonderful museum as well with almost 20 historic buildings that still are intact on the property so, or structures. So uh, this sort of just shows some of the, the uh, previous uh, pictures and then some of the more current pictures. Uh, we have some of the largest trees on the island, uh, and one of the most unusual trees on the island. We're always adding to those collections. Where we have a, we're a three-legged, or a three, I guess a three-headed monster in a way, because we are a historic site, we are a state park, and we are a public arboretum. So we have to really balance all those things. And uh, we have wonderful collections that we're always adding to. We have a historic site that we're trying to keep intact. And it's a place to come to just walk and to enjoy nature. So we have all those things that we try to balance and give equal time to. Uh, this is the Italian Garden, which was renovated in, 19, in 2009, opened in 2010. That was a collaboration again between the Foundation and State Parks. And uh, we had a big party that uh, 2010. It was a great party at, in, the, in the garden. And it is literally one of the most popular places for people to come, especially photographers especially weddings. We uh, accommodate about 1,500 wedding parties a year. And most of them end up in that, in that garden. So, um, so we are bringing a lot of these iconic features back into the fold. And that's, again, collaborative work between the foundation and the state. I think I would add that the site was added to the National Register Historic Place in 1979. Is that correct, Dave? Yeah, that sounds good. 1979. <laughs> <laughs> we always look at Chris, by the way, because 
Chris goes in. Um, so one of the things that's really particularly interesting for me is thinking about how while the Coe family was really looking towards the past for the inspiration for the architecture, the landscape design in their collection, they also were very much uh, interested and supportive of, of uh, uh, artists of their time, artists, designers, and also landscape architects as well. Um, so these are just some examples of our images from our archives. Uh, the bottom left image is the Buffalo Room. Um, that is by the artist Robert Winston Chandler. Uh, top left is uh, the Italian, in the, in the Italian garden, the tea house that was designed by Elsie Wolf, um, really the most foremost interior decorator of the era. Um, and it has mural work by Everett Shin. And then the top, the, two, the image on the right, uh, the color of the current day photograph, and one next to it, the pirate work by Samuel Yellen. And so he was really an important early American arts and crafts artist. So as you kind of think about this estate, as hopefully at the end of this meeting, you can tour the property as well. Um, there's a distinctly kind of American tradition that the Coe's embraced and had added to uh, the vernacular of the site. And that's, that's something that we, that we think shows some of the relevance of it as well. So moving on to current initiatives, uh, this is the West Portal, which is the structure right outside these doors here. And um, there's, there are some major issues here, as you can see in the images. I'm going to try to do the pointer right here. You see kind of the laminated masonry falling off all three facades of the structure. Um, this is really due to improper drainage from the balcony above. Um, and it's just been an issue that, that's been, been getting worse. Um, so we, as of earlier this year, closed it off because it really is a life safety issue. Uh, there's masonry falling right below where uh, people will be walking. And um, the foundation received a grant from New York State, the EPF, uh, EPF grant, to work on the documentation phase. So we're working on that now. And just put an application again to work on the actual conservation of the space. But uh, Vinny can probably speak to how key this location is for visitors, for yeah. photo shoots, for weddings. Yeah. The West Portico is literally the most popular place for our patrons to go, especially photographers, any kind of filming and things like that. Um, you know, if the weather's inclement, brides can go under there to get out of the weather and get their photographs still taken. So it's a very iconic, uh, not to mention it's iconic in terms of how it's connected to this side, this side of the building. And then there's a landscape around there that's pretty beautiful with views that go out to the landscape. So it absolutely is uh, critical that we restore this and get this back in working order again. Vincent, can I, uh, just to clarify, EPF grant for design, or is there instruction funds allocated yet? Where where does this project stand in terms of? This is CFA, consolidated funding allocation. Really great. So we received money for the construction documents. So that was the uh, design phase, yes. and then construction phase is next. And, and still to be applied for, or you have an application yet? Just applied in July. So just now, right. so right. December. All right. All right. I might add that Planning Fields has been very fortunate to receive quite a few EPF, separate EPF grants over the years for the Italian Garden, the Shopping Gates, and many other things. So we've been very fortunate to have those funds available for us. If you, if you Google Planning Fields, this is actually a location that comes up frequently. It's, it's kind of a, an iconic spot of the property. So um, fortunately, there hasn't been too much visitor disruption. People no. have been complaining, no. but it's something that we, we did anticipate. But it is just it's closed right now. So um, back okay. So this is a color image of the uh, Buffalo uh, Buffalo mural by Robert Wood Chandler. And after this meeting, if anybody would like to, happy to walk uh, to that space and talk a little bit more about this. But this is a really exceptional um, piece of, of Cove Hall because Robert Wood Chandler did was highly prolific, um, but only a few of his spaces like this still exist, and all of them are really challenged with the preservation of these spaces. So some examples are the swimming pool ceiling at the Sky Museum and Gardens that has had constant issues, um, as well as the Virgin and Wilkins Studio for Studio in Greenwich Village, the New York Studio School now. Um, so we have been partnering for, for ever, really, on this, on this project. Um, and next week or in a few weeks, conservators from, from People's Island will come up and continue work on this. Um, the next year actually marks the centennial of this mural. So being that it is one of two extant spaces that is accessible to the public, it's really an important space to preserve and interpret and make sure that all, all our visitors come and, and are able to see this space. Yeah, I just want to add, this is another collaborative project. So the foundation staff, the operator staff, Chris Flagg and the conservators have all been working on this. Uh, we've been trying to stabilize the HVAC system, the climate control system, to make sure this space is adequately protected. And then, of course, the conservators are doing their work at the final stages, stages of work 
to make sure that this mural is preserved. And it is such a unique uh, part of the, of the house. So. This is a hand-painted mural on the walls of that room. It and is. you have uh, art conservatives working for your store now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're three quarters done. Right. They have right. a small section of one wall, right wall, which you first enter the room from the dining room. Right. So there's a section that's not finished. Right. And if we were to visit today, we could see before and after. Yeah. It's, it's so always going to require a remedial. Constant. It has inherent biases that it was mm -hmm. constructed in the hardness of the Jessa. But it, it, it has been, sorry to interrupt, but uh, one of the things that in the collaboration between the agency and the foundation was to work on the addressing the problems that led, contribute to the failure in humidity and temperature control. Sure. So all that work was done first exterior storm doors, HVAC system, and then once the conditions were stabilized as best they could, then the conservation work began. And how long has the conservation effort been going on? Two years? years? Well, depends on how far back you Oh, OK. <laughs> so you, you said it's 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 15 or 20 years ago. That's correct. Right? <laughs> wow. If Thank the you. artist was still alive, he would say, of course, it was the contractors. <laughs> but I will add that in our archives, there's a letter um, from W.R. Co. that says, if, if this, if this in, uh, mural keeps on flaking, let's just take it down. Oh. There were issues then already, as there have been at the wow. Skya and, and the New York Studio School. So actually, our space is in extraordinary condition compared to other sites. And um, we're working on organizing an expedition next year uh, to coincide with the commemoration of, of 100 years of this mural being here right. and the completion of the state conservation work. Right. Um, this is just this is May Coe's bedroom. This space was originally also painted by Robert Michael Chandler. The canvases were removed when the third Mrs. Coe arrived. And uh, so this is a recreation that was done by an artist about 10 years ago. But just to give you a sense of another space that was, was painted by Chandler. So we recently, um, earlier this year, completed the project to restore May Co. and W.R. Co.'s dressing rooms. The May Co. you can see in the bottom left, W.R. Co. on the top right. These were designed by Elsie DeWolf. Um, the funding of this came from the Gary Charitable Trust and was a really amazing opportunity. I've seen four photos of this space. Uh, there were just storage spaces and um, concrete walls. So it's a really great opportunity to show kind of this early 20th century moment to our visitors. Um, what's really quite exceptional, that photograph there, as you can see an electric bath, which was pretty trendy at that time, I think it was only for a couple of years. But that really shows um, the era in which this place was created. It shows this period of this time and dates it. Uh, so this is a great accomplishment that, that we have finished earlier this year. And then uh, the cultural landscape report. Amy, report. why don't you talk about that? Yeah, so, uh, well, and certainly Kristen too. Chris really is one who initiated the cultural landscape report. Got it, you know, getting, getting to the point where it is now. And the foundation um, has um, hired a, a firm, uh, Heritage Landscapes, to sort of do the final phase of the cultural landscape report to finish it, which will then give us a document that sort of a management document that we use to bring back the highlights of the, you know, the integrity of the historic landscape. Uh, again, a lot of incredible archives that we used and pulled for this project. I don't know if you want to edit anything, but it's going to be a terrific document. I think it's going to be a very useful document. Um, and, and just guide us and help us in many ways. We also have a master plan, which sort of uh, is another document that we use, you know, to, to help guide our decisions here. But um, you know, it's a it's a big project, it's a collaborative project again that, that uh, you know is in its final stages. I would say. What I think is pretty remarkable to add about the firm that we're working with, Heritage Landscapes, whose principal is Patricia O'Donnell, who's been in this industry for about 32 years and worked in I think 50 plus Homestead. Uh, Homestead Owens and Brothers properties, um, is that their approach is very much thinking about the historic precedent and bringing sites back to the historic precedent, but also thinking about current needs. So obviously, this is not an estate any longer one family. It's a public, uh, a private, a public uh, site with about 200,000 visitors a year. So how do we uh, think about the evolution of the site and make it, make it functional um, in that sense? So here are some other photographs um, from our archives again. These are all photographed by Maddie Edwards Hewitt or Francis Benjamin Johnson, two of the leading photographers of the early 20th century, who photographed um, a lot of architecture and landscapes in, in this country. So it just kind of gives you a sense of what the landscape uh, looked like at that time. And then uh, finally, the, the gate lodge. So this is the original entrance to the, the estate. These are the Kershalton gates, the entrances on Chicken Valley Road. Uh, these no longer serve as a primary entrance, and adjacent to that is the, is the gate lodge. So the foundation is really um, working to 
rehabilitate the space. Uh, this has been the residence of the executive director, uh, so it will be my future home. Um, but we're working on this project. That's an important architectural piece as well. It's designed by uh, Walker and Gillette. And this is really, the space is kind of the, the face of planting fields. This is, as you, it's the most visible um, aspect of it. It's monumental. People are always kind of curious about what that is. So the restoration of this building and the whole area around it will, will be a really important moment. Right, and the landscape was uh, installed and designed by the Olmsted brothers, so that's another important key element. There are many, those trees, of course, many of those trees are now gone, they have since the nest, but we have uh, planted new trees pretty much in the similar location, so a lot of these trees are already in place and growing, but there are some tweaks we need to do the landscape, open up the landscape a bit, but um, that was done about 20 years ago. The gates were restored in 2003, I believe, and that was a, another EPF grant with foundation money uh, that Lorraine Gilligan had applied for at the time to uh, restore the gates. Those gates are about 118 feet long and 18 feet high. They were uh, created, wrought in 1711, and then brought onto the property around 1929, I think it was. Uh, and Mr. Coe actually purchased an extra five acres outside the gates so that you'd have an approach, so you'd actually see the gates. Today, the gates are lit, they're, so they're lit at night, they're, they're a highlight at night, and they're a highlight for certain special events that we have. We don't open them regularly. Um, and you can see them from afar, but you can't get to them really unless we allow you to, basically. Um, but they are pretty, pretty special, iconic uh, gates. Yeah. Are you able to replace the trees with the same species today? Whenever possible, we try to go with the same species or similar species. In that case, those are European beaches. Mm -hmm. There was no reason not to. In fact, I think they're really noble trees that have a certain majesty to them that you won't see in other trees. So yes, those are all the original, you know, same species as with their original. Gina, I hope you'll be able to commute to work through those gates. Whoops. Okay, so um, those are really all a lot of the tangible projects that we're working on, but there's a lot of intangible work going on as well. So we just kicked off the strategic planning process. We're working with Ann Akerson on that. Akerson, many of you may know. Um, we are really thinking about how to revitalize our education program and our interpretive plan. And think particularly about the visitor experience and going back to the mission of both New York State and the foundation central to that is the visitor experience and creating reaching opportunities. Um, so these are all just images of, of programs that have taken place here in the last couple of months and we're trying to think about how can we really create deep encounters with the site, um, whether it's just for fun recreational experiences or really more educational and depth encounters. Um, and um, at the same time, we're also looking at our membership program, how to cultivate really a stakeholder, group of group of stakeholders to support the organization. So a lot of wonderful work underway, uh, and actually it's just a lot quite fun, um, but the, the collaboration has been key to all of this, and I um, hope that was helpful to give you a little insight to work too. Just, uh, just a couple of things, you know, this is a very complicated place. We have a lot of moving parts. We have, you know, the largest public greenhouse on the island, which is over 60,000 square feet. We have 200 cultivated acres, 409 acres total, which is a lot of a lot of maintenance to take care of those, those areas. We have over 20 uh, buildings, most of which are historic. We have something like four and a half acres of, of building space, four and a half acres. Most of that is heated. So you can imagine what it takes to maintain all those historic buildings and all those old buildings. Uh, we have public programs. We have uh, support organizations, green industry associations that come here and support us. We have volunteers, we have a very dedicated staff that are stewards of this property. So, um, you know, we really do take a lot of pride in this place. We have a lot of work to do. We've, we've accomplished a lot, but we have a lot more work to do. And it's going to be exciting to see this place over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years because I think we have a good plan and good, good people in place to make it happen. So, okay. thank you very much. Okay, uh, Lucy, uh, would you introduce yourself? Uh, is this our custom since we already went around right. the morning and did that? I'm going to roll call. Yeah, uh, first, my apologies. Four different things happened. <laughs> made me so, um, Lucy will let me be um, chair of the New York State Council of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Thank you. And you established a quorum for this meeting. And with that, we will do the formal roll call. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Doug Pirelli. Here. Eric Krieger? Here. Lee Dalrich? Here. Kristen Heron? Here. Lucy Walewski? Here. J.D. Lorenzo? Here. Carol Clark? Here. 
And then action, Jennifer Lamack, Paul Stewart, Wayne Goodman, and Chuck Bander. <laughs> All right, we've circulated the minutes. Uh, you've all had a chance to review those. Um, well, we don't have, um, we're doing it differently this time because we don't have seven people who were on the board last time. So Kathleen Martinez has figured out another way to do it um, just by, you've all had a chance to read them. So Doug is gonna ask if anybody has any corrections and then we're just gonna do it unanimously unless you wanna make Anybody have any additional comments or corrections for the minutes? Thanks. The minutes are, yeah, the minutes are good. Our minutes stand approved. The minutes stand approved. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving now to reports. Sure. Daniel? Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, Commissioner Kulase uh, sends his regrets at not being able to attend this meeting. He will be at the December meeting of the State Review Board. Uh, and uh, I look forward to that. Um, you, uh, for those on the review board, uh, obviously you're noticing um, a shortened list of national register nominations. Uh, there are 14 on the agenda today. Typically we're operating in the 20, 20 plus range. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to acknowledge that this is in large part due to uh, family leave, uh, one person out on family leave. Uh, there has been addition to the Division staff, a young junior member, not yet sworn in, but um, very pleased with that. Um, but we are down staff in the National Register Unit. Uh, we have put in, uh, the division has put in for 13 critical fills uh, in a, a request for restaffing and additional staff uh, at the Division for Historic Preservation, and uh, those are being considered uh, by the Division of Budget and the agency, along with, uh, you know, similar requests from, from the parks region. So we, we are seeking to restaff both in the NR unit. Um, we are, despite being short staffed, we're further short staffed because of family leave. I also want to announce, uh, although you will be uh, seeing uh, presentations today from Bill Krattinger, a uh, long time member of the NR unit, uh, Bill will be taking a bit of a professional sabbatical in the sense that he will be stepping out of the NR unit uh, effective tomorrow. Uh, and leading a three-year project to survey the historic resources of the state park system statewide. Uh, this is actually documentation uh, that is long overdue uh, for the agency, uh, and uh, Bill will be coordinating with the planning unit downtown, the GIS unit downtown, GIS uh, and, and information technology staff, and the survey unit at the division uh, on what we anticipate to be a 36-month uh, process we will be visiting every single state park historic site uh, in the state, uh, surveying for archaeological uh, historic landscape and historic structures. The intent is uh, multifold. It is in part to streamline uh, reviews within the state park system under 1409 the State Preservation Act. It's also going to help us identify really the long-term capital funding needs uh, for the State Historic Park System uh, opportunities for the Resident Curator Program, for example, uh, new license uh, agreement opportunities where we can find public part or private partners to come in uh, and help steward uh, underutilized, uh, unused buildings in the State Park System. Uh, it's a, going to be a very important project and we appreciate Bill uh, taking a hiatus from the NR unit. We will miss him greatly. He is a uh, high capacity staff uh, for the NR unit, uh, but that work begins tomorrow. Um, I head this afternoon to extreme western New York uh, to um, attend a meeting convened by Devin Lander, state historian, uh, members of the state museum staff, OPRHP, uh, and others. Uh, it's the third meeting uh, in the state this year to begin planning for the Revolutionary War 250th commemoration uh, anniversaries ahead, uh, 2024, 2020, uh, 2033 time frame is how we're interpreting uh, that commemorative period uh, at this point in time, an eight year celebration. We do expect the state park system uh, and the state historic site system to play really the key role in New York State's commemoration. Uh, there certainly are some National Park Service sites, Federal Hall in New York, uh, Saratoga Battlefield uh, in Saratoga, uh, Fort Stanwix National Monument out in Rome, but it's really the state park system that is uh, in position with uh, 
over 50 sites either directly or indirectly associated with the Revolutionary War uh, that is in a position to tell the Red War story at the time of uh, the upcoming 250th commemoration. So this will be a, a further planning meeting. I just will note too that Westchester County and Orange County have both initiated planning efforts uh, for the same commemoration. We're pleased to see that. I had a meeting with the National Park Service in New York uh, several weeks ago, uh, and there are New York State um, uh, friends groups for the National Park System in New York City are particularly keen on positioning New York City uh, as really the host city for this nationally for this commemoration as opposed to Boston or, or Philadelphia. So some interesting dynamics there. Finally, I just want to acknowledge uh, two National Park Service grants uh, that, the part, that the agency has received. One is for the third phase uh, of the New York City LGBTQ project uh, to list uh, some additional uh, uh, sites um, that have been surveyed and identified by that project uh, to the National Register. And we also received an American Battlefield Protection Program grant for a cultural resource and archaeology survey at Horse Island, an island off Sackett's Harbor uh, that, was located, that was recently acquired by the agency as an expansion of the Sackett's Harbor historic site. So that survey work will begin soon. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Any report from Washington that we can take in covers of the program? No, sir. <laughs> Let's set the uh, Moving on to board business, there's just two items that I want to discuss here. The first is the awards presentation that happens at our December meeting. I'm asking everyone uh, on the board and within earshot to uh, think about uh, special projects, projects of special importance, uh, national reviews that you've read that you think are really great, other things that are happening in your local region that you know about to put forward for the Historic Preservation Awards. Uh, we need to give Dan McEnany some information from the board by about September 10th. So we have a few days after this meeting to work together as a group to, to put something forward. I'm asking for your help in doing that. Kristen, uh, you responded to my email about this with a, a nice suggestion. And if you would just reiterate that so to give people some ideas about what we're looking for. So correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was the March meeting we reviewed Sands, the, it's the community in Long Island, in Suffolk County, Sag Harbor, Sag Harbor Hills, Hills, Minova, Asperus, Asperus, and Georgia Greer Community gave a wonderful presentation. So for me, that's an important community. It was, and the fact that it was really community driven is something I like to see. So that's what I wanted to throw out as a possibility. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great example. So, any other suggestions that people have off the top of their heads? Yeah, it could be a person, it could be a nomination, it could be a project, it could be a group. It is. Any? Yeah, think more broadly than the National Register forms that we're reviewing. Uh, well, in our it could travels. be a nomination. Absolutely, absolutely, but not limited to that. Um, in the back. Uh, Oak Island Beach, Lysing Station, the town of well, Dan needs something written up from you, not just a suggestion. He's not going to be able to do the research. He needs you to write something up. If you can do that and send it to me. Could you repeat that, though? Because I can look into that. Oak Island Beach Licensing Station. It's a town of Avalon and uh, early Licensing State. Uh, but they've just done a massive restoration project. They got uh, some money from the state. They worked with ship out on right. the restoration. It's an amazing building. It's going to be used to the public, open to the public. I think they did a really great job. Thank you for that suggestion. That's yeah. right. But that was also under our Sandy Grant, Hurricane Sandy 2013, as a visible work grant. So, which is all over the place. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the town that's in there, Mary Pascoe, is, is an incredible resource. <coughs> and I'm sure she was a major part of why that project came out so well. But she's an incredible resource that I'm sure she could provide any information. Great. You Thank you very much for that suggestion. Uh, Doug, Old Westbury Gardens for their, their roof and the restoration of the porch at the uh, east end of the building. Uh, huge undertaking and uh, maybe a year too early, but uh, we should keep an eye on the Roslyn uh, Christmas restoration. Old Westbury and Roslyn. Yeah. You were on that? Okay, good. Any
any other suggestions that I can jot down? Thank you very much for that. Uh, which brings us to the next meeting location, which is, as I understand it, to be determined. Well, yeah, I'm going to be working with Dan because it is the awards. Um, it will be in the Capital District, but it probably won't be at People's Island. But I'm going to be working with Dan to find a nice space in the Albany Prize next week. Could you remind us of the date? It's uh, December 4th. Uh, no, it's um, December 3rd, I believe, because we were asked not to do it on the date of the um, calendars in my bag. I think it's December 3rd. Is that right? Um, it's not the date of the um, Taconic annual meeting. Jay, can you give us the actual date there? I, I uh, I mean, mine says, mine says, mine says the 4th. But no, it's a Wednesday, not a Thursday. So that would be a 4th. Yeah, December 4th. Yeah. In the Albany area. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other board business that anyone would like to bring to our attention at this time? Okay. Yeah, well, I just have one thing, if I, if I may. Um, I wanted, and some of you probably know, I wanted to bring uh, the board's attention to a process that's going on as we speak um, that's driven by the New York State Power Authority. Uh, it is called the Reimagine the Canal Task Force. And this is a... Um, this is a process that um, seems to have a pretty tight time frame. Um, I would anticipate, or we're anticipating, based on what we know, that this task force that they have assembled will have the recommendations in place as early as October um, with some kind of a report or a presentation or something. Now, you'll recall that um, last time I spoke about this and the board spoke about this, we were talking about the historic tug Urger um, and the power authority's treatment of that historic vessel and their other uh, historic work working vessels as part of the canal fleet. Um, we also know how much time the board uh, spent on reviewing uh, the nomination for the canal way and that it is a national historic landmark. So it certainly has uh, great significance and covers a tremendous swath of New York State and also a tremendous amount of population in New York State which is very close by. Um, this task force that was assembled by the Power Authority um, does not have a specific preservation voice involved with it. Uh, the League was not invited to participate. The State Parks, my understanding, has a number of regional parks directors as part of the task force. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, and, and we know that the Erie Canal and National Heritage Area people have representation on that. There, but there's really no um, standalone voice for historic preservation on that task force. So we were very disappointed by that, um, that that's not there. And of course, what ends up happening then is we're very concerned about what their deliberations are and the direction this is going. So they have had meetings to provide public input, uh, but we're not clear on how great an impact that public input will have on the process. So my long way, that's my long way of saying we have some real concerns. What we would like to see, um, and based on what we have heard, and I don't want to get into kind of the scuttlebutt that we have heard second and third hand about kind of what's going on behind the scenes on this, but uh, the league's interest primarily, well, we have a few things. We want to make sure that the waterway itself remains open and operable to motorized and paddled vessels. So uh, we want to make sure that the historic resources along the canal, which include um, all of the resources, the locks, new and old, the large canal, the old canal, all of it remains maintained to the extent that it's continuously uh, available to, to the public to see and enjoy and learn. We want to see that continue. We want to see the historic working fleet uh, maintained and in operation. Uh, we want to see the canal promoted uh, as a resource for heritage tourism and economic development. And we also want to make sure that the canal itself and the communities around it really can capitalize upon the economic development uh, dollars that have already poured in for things like the Empire State Bike Trail, which is going to be down the length of this. So what we are doing as an organization is coming out with a position statement I would like to recommend that the State Board uh, consider doing something similar so that they hear from multiple resources the importance of the canal and its historic significance 
because right now we're operating with limited information. Is there going to be an opportunity for a review of the report that's produced in October and a public comment of that? And is that something that the board could profitably review and, and provide a comment on? I am not sure, and one of the reasons why we at the league felt that it was important to step out now and say something mm -hmm. is because we're not sure how far along this would be if it gets to a final report, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that our concerns are made very apparent right now. Well, I think you're right. I mean, you know, if, if we and others made public comments after the deed is done, right. uh, it will be seen uh, maybe uh, on the second floor and elsewhere as raining on the parade of, of something to which a lot of effort has been put. Uh, I reimagining the canal and not reimagining it as a waterway that's used by the public is horrifying. But anything is possible in this world, and I think you're absolutely right, Jay. Um, and, because it's altogether appropriate for this board to act now. And it may be very awkward to act uh, two months from now. So let me, uh, OVRHP has a seat on that task force. Uh, uh, obviously the commissioner uh, holds that seat. Uh, what Eric uh, chose to do in this instance was to appoint a five, uh, five member project team, so it includes Mark Mistretta, uh, Rob Hilfrands, Elaine Balchinian, um, who am I missing? Uh, anyway, the four parks regions that overlap the canal corridor, the regional directors for those regions, and myself, uh, representing the Division for Historic Preservation. Um, NIPA has set an attendance limit of one person per agency, which means I have not been able to attend the task force meeting yet. The task force meetings, uh, the deliberations are considered confidential. Uh, so there has been a public meeting component uh, that took place across the state, across the canal corridor in the July time frame. I attended several of those meetings uh, because I, you know, there's no restriction on my doing so. Uh, there's an, a second round of task force meetings scheduled for second week of October, and we're going to try to, uh, I'm going to try to leverage my way into those. Uh, I have. Uh, staff is already preparing materials, uh, looking at um, a number of um, resource needs and issues along the corridor. It's been a summer-long project just trying to understand, in effect, the state of historic preservation in the 200-plus canal communities. Um, at some point, uh, regardless of where these deliberations end, there will be a 1409 or Section 106 review process that the division will be undertaking. Uh, for some of these projects that are federally permitted or state permitted funded, et cetera. So I've been trying to prepare, uh, trying to prepare us for that. Um, but it has been frustrating for me uh, not, to, um, not to have been allowed access into the deliberations uh, at this stage. Um, my own understanding is uh, your Canal National Heritage Corridor is also about to release a position statement. Um, so I think that will be interesting. Introduction. Uh, there has been coverage of this issue in the Buffalo News. Uh, maybe Jay could consider certainly both the initial news article as well as that subsequent editorial. Sure. Uh, pulled back from that a bit. Uh, um, so, uh, anyway. So, OPRHP has a seat at the table for those meetings, one of the five task uh, force members. Who's been attending the meetings? Uh, so, as the meetings have been occurring on a regional basis, the regional directors have been attending in their, in their region. We're reporting back to the task force. Yes, sir. Uh, but there, it, there's a confidential uh, confidentiality yeah. requirement, but surely that doesn't mean that, that your colleagues can't report to you. No, that's correct. No, well, we're not asking you to say anything, but... Uh, but if you were to say I'm glad. <laughs> no, you say. Now, are we contemplating, do I hear a motion? for board action in this regard? Uh, are, are, are we moving to write a letter, uh, have some involvement here, or are we just adopting a uh, wait and see posture? Well, I don't think it should be, I mean, personally, I don't think it should be a wait and see posture. I think we should do a letter or a position statement um, to, to the power of the um, and others. 
All right, I'm hearing a motion to propose a letter from the board to NICO. So moved. All right, I'm just taking some notes here. That needs to be rather carefully crafted. Yes, indeed. And I would recommend that Jay, maybe, if you like the first draft, and we as a group review it. Sure. Is that uh, reasonable? Sure. All right, so uh, can I have a formal motion to, for the State Review Board to write, write a letter to NICO? So moved. Erica. So moved, Erica. Erica. Do I have a second? Second. Wind. Wind. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Jay and I work together to like that. And not to be the bearer of bad news, but um, I didn't know if we wanted to speak about the proposed changes to the National Register. Um, and I don't know if Carol is, um, would you like to take that on? Sure, I think that you've already been briefed as a group earlier yeah. this year about the changes to the National Register that were proposed without any notice being given uh, by the Department of the Interior in early March. I've been recently digging into this issue further, and Betsy Merritt at the National Trust Council there, and also uh, the fellow who's the Executive Director of the National Association for State and Historic Preservation Officers, has been actively working on uh, opposing this measure, but it would seem by all intents and purposes that uh, indeed it's going to, by the end of the calendar year, end, go forth and be adopted by the Department of the Interior. And, precisely the form that you heard about it before. And just to highlight it, there really would be three main changes. There are new powers to block nominations to the register. This would apply mainly to federal properties. Um, I have a handout, by the way, which I'll be happy to circulate to all of you. Larger landowners would have more say in the matter. It would no longer be a system of you know, one owner of one vote. And there would be a negation of Section 106 by not determining eligibility. So it's taken together. These are consequential changes. And in some aspects, it's going to have an impact. And it really doesn't seem that although there were some 5,000 negative comments that were placed on the record uh, there, and some dozen or so in favor, 5,000 <laughs> certain, a dozen in favor, there really is no comment coming forth from the Department of the Interior the Park Service about the substance of the matter, no response on this whatsoever, and every indication that it's going to go through. Um, I understand from Betsy Merritt and others that the, the trust intends to sue, but that's the state of affairs that this is in. And I think it's more of a concern to us, given that we are the state board for preservation in New York and we have the largest number of National Register properties, and I don't know how many of them are federal. Build properties, maybe not so many, but well, we don't have. Uh, it's more the western states, of course. Where there's so much federally owned land, exactly. It wouldn't affect us as much, except for when there's a federal property in a district, right? But, but in the western states, it's devastating. Um, it's devastating, and the tribal lives are for us. The big out. impact would be the larger landowners um, having more vote, and particularly um, in us being able to. Um, the number of landowners um, and you know the, the percentage, um, especially if you're talking about like a condo, if, if you're trying to figure out in a New York City condo what percent of like whose condo is 800 square feet and whose condo is 900 square feet and how many what percentage of the building is owned by people who objected that sort of thing. That's that's a huge impact. We don't get the large numbers of objections in districts that um, some other states do. But as I think we talked about the last time this came up, what it might affect for us is, say, a small tax credit project where you had only three or four owners, and like maybe one of them was a church, and the ch that would just be one of four. And if the other three were in favor of it, it wouldn't matter before. But if the church owned the largest parcel, then the church could then stop it now. Precisely. That's that's what that's what would affect us. Right. Um, we don't get a lot of um, a lot of objections in districts um, in this state. Or university in historic district. Or yeah. any, large any large owner, you know, if you had three people who wanted to use a tax credit and the fourth person didn't. Right. And right now the fourth fourth person wouldn't have a say in the nomination because it would be three to one. If that fourth person owned a larger parcel than the others, then it would have to stop it. Yeah. 
that's that's a bigger concern to us here. Do the proposed regs have a formula to, to determine that? No. No. Not now. Not now. It's just it goes by each it, owner gets one vote regardless of what percentage no, of the property. No, I But change. now in the new regs, it would it goes by um, it's either yeah, the number of owners or the amount of land you own. I think it's by cubits. <laughs> And they haven't said, they actually haven't said whether it's square feet, acres, cubic. No, it, 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 that level of detail is not part of the current right. proposal. Uh, it's simply I, a shift from the number of people right. to the surface Yeah, area. so in other words, it's not democratic anymore. Yeah. It goes back to larger landowners have more power rather than one owner, one vote, the way it was before. I went with a summary just this past weekend um, based on my research and I'll be presenting it to Carol said there were, you know, five, four or five thousand letters opposed to this, including by many large organizations and former keepers of the register and, you know, at the AIA and, and, and only a few, a handful of letters in favor of it, including like the National Mining Association like that. Okay, thank you. So yes. do you want to circulate that? Yes, yeah, so I'm happy to circulate it. No, I'm happy to fill any questions. Trust is, um, yes, the trust is not in that they have an intention to. Right. Can you tell the trust will be going to play in the same That's right. Quite certain. But that's all I've got. Just, um, just a proposal? Do you, just a proposal? Just a proposal. 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 Just a I mean, not that it's good for this. Can you send me this document electronically so of I can circulate it? Uh, Absolutely. Well, the comment period is closed. The comment period is closed. Right. So what will happen, what is, uh, what is required by law to happen is that the National Park Service is required to issue a response to summarize the public comments on this proposed rulemaking uh, and you know, provide a bulleted response, a case-by-case -case response we have not heard a timeline for that. Uh, it is a requirement of the process. They would be uh, further exposed legally if they did not uh, provide uh, that uh, that response document. Um, so we're, we're waiting. We're in the holding phase. Right. Daniel, I know that the Attorney General of New York is very busy uh, working on all sorts of things to oppose the administration in Washington. But I think this is something that could be added to the, uh, to the, to the list. Uh, Any other board business that board members would like to bring up at this time? Thank you. Uh, moving on to the agenda to National Register Reviews. All right, we're going to start with uh, the Schaefer and Brothers Malt House in Buffalo, New York. Did you bring samples? Yeah, you have beer? Uh, did you bring it? No, uh -huh. I thought you were bringing it. I thought you were bringing it. All right, next time, for sure. <laughs> Support local business. <laughs> so the Schaefer and Brother Malt House is a good example of a malt house building type, which is associations with two significant manufacturers during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The building is significant under criterion A in the area of industry for its association with Buffalo's once thriving malting and brewing industry and for its later associations with the local chocolate industry. The period of significance pertaining to this criteria begins with the construction of the building in 1880 and ends with the exit of the Merkins Chocolate Company in 1951. It's nice to go from here to chocolate. I know, it's a fun building. <laughs> so the Schaefer and Brother Malting Company erected the malt house in a small grain elevator in 1880 and operated from the facility until 1919. Brothers Gustafus and Henry Schaefer formed a seed and grain business in 1863 that shifted into the thriving malt business within a decade as the malting market in the region grew in conjunction with the local brewing industry. In 1880, as the Schaefer and, malting, Schaefer and Brother Malting Company grew, a malt house was built at 527 7th Street. The Schaefer Brother Malt House is one of the most intact and last remaining malt houses from the period prior to pre prohibition when malting and brewing were major local industries in Buffalo. The building is also notable for its association with the chocolate industry in Buffalo after World War I. Between 1919 and 1951, the Schaefer and Brother Malt House was utilized briefly by the Reed Chocolate Company before becoming the longtime home of the locally prominent Merkins Chocolate Company. The latter company made several additions to the building that facilitated larger production volumes and new technologies. 
The tenure of these chocolate companies exemplifies national trends in the chocolate industry after World War I. However, by the mid-20th century, the chocolate industry developed into an increasingly mechanized, large-scale process dominated by nat national companies. In 1951, the American's Chocolate Company finished moving its operations from the building, ending the building's use as a manufacturing site. So the Schaefer Malt House is also notable under Criterion C in the area of architecture as a locally significant example of a late 19th century malt house designed in the Germanic Rundbogenstiel, or round arched style. It's a relatively rare example of this building type uh, and architectural style remaining in the city of Buffalo. Many of these have been demolished and lost along the way. The brick building was designed in this style, which was commonly utilized for buildings in the brewing and malting industries due to its Germanic origins. Furthermore, the Schaefer and Mother Malt House retains characteristics that highlight advanced malt house design, with, including built-in temperature control. So the building layout facilitated the malting production line, and while original, original machinery no longer exists, the functional divisions reflecting the production process are still legible from the floor plan. The company functioned on the site until 1919 when prohibition undermined many malting and brewing operations in the city. The open floor plan that first served the malting business pr proved an easy transition to the chocolate industry, which also utilized the production lines. Now the building is also significant because of its small grain elevator, and though reduced in height, it illustrates a rare intact example of crib construction in Buffalo. And I got really excited about what looks like a really not very exciting part of the building, but this is why. Mm -hmm. So wood crib construction was the earliest method used for building grain elevators, consisting of stacked wood planks held together with iron pins, often clad in metal to protect it from the elements. Wood crib construction dates back to Joseph Dart's invention of wood elevators in Buffalo in 1842. However, they were largely replaced by concrete silos, which were much more fire resistant and cost effective to construct. The last remaining wood grain elevator in Buffalo, the Wollenberg grain elevator, burned down in 2006. Although slightly diminished in height, the Schaefer and Brother Malt House may be the last remaining example of a wood crib constructed grain elevator remaining in the city of Buffalo today. So that was a really kind of exciting mm -hmm. forensic discovery. So this is the Schaefer and Brother Malt House. Are there any questions on this project? Do you have any sense for how many wood crib elevators there were at one time? Oh. Tons. I mean, that was the predominant between the 1840s and sort of the end of the, the 19th century. That was the predominant construction. So the fact that this is the last one is it truly be, significant. Yeah, it may be the last remaining example of that construction method in the city of Buffalo. So. Other questions or comments from the board? It may be the last, but in order to figure out if it were the last, it would be quite an undertaking. Yes, well, the Wollenberg, the Wollenberg elevator was said to have been the last. So that's good. It's okay. So when we found this, Quite likely that it is the last. It, it very well may be. So this was unrecognized as, as such until yes. you? Yes, yes. Until the okay. research began, began to hey. uh, And actually, until not very recently, this was clad in this kind of cardboardish paneling. Um, yeah, that was, it was just removed question. during. Yeah. So we knew, based on the sandboard information, that that was what it was called. But we didn't couldn't physically see this until relatively recently when wow. they had some water damage that they had to remove it. And, what a surprise. Yeah, it's amazing. So there it is. Any other questions or comments from the board? Do I hear a motion to accept this nomination? Second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstain or opposed? Good. Thank you. Moving on to St. Matthias Episcopal Church, East Aurora. All right. So. The St. Matthias Episcopal Church complex, located in the village of East Aurora, is locally significant as a representative example of an early 20th century Gothic Revival Episcopal Church, which reflects the history and growth of the parish and the community throughout the 20th century. It consists of three contributing buildings, including a church, a rectory, and a garage. The church complex has been, not has been a notable feature of East Aurora's main street since the parish's founding in the 1870s. Significant under Criterion C for architecture, the complex reflects several stages of construction and growth of the church and its parish in East Aurora. The period of significance for St. Matthias Episcopal Church complex is 1923 to 1963. This period begins when the rectory was donated for use by the congregation in 1923, includes the construction of the present church in 1928, and ends with the construction of an addition in 1963. 
a little easier to see in this <laughs> historic photo when the trees are off, leaves are off the tree. So the parish of St. Matthias began in the year 1869 when the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Western New York received a letter from a small group of Episcopalians in the town of East Aurora seeking approval to establish a congregation. The first church constructed for St. Matthias was a modest wood frame building erected around 1871 designed to provide space for about 100 worshipers. As the parish grew throughout the 19th century, the vestry, vestry and rector recognized the need for a larger church, but financial difficulties delayed the process for several years. It wasn't until 1925 that the church had raised enough money to hire an architect to design the new church, and in December of that year, architect and parishioner Robert North was hired to develop preliminary plans for the new church. Construction on the new church began with the cornerstone ceremonies on September 10, 1927. Designed with a similar cross-axial massing as the pre previous church, the new church was positioned on nearly the same location. The older 1870s frame church was moved across the street uh, to, to the opposite corner to make way for this new building. The church was completed according to North's design and formally opened in 1928. In response to post-growth growth, an addition containing classrooms and offices was added to the building in 1963, which is shown down in the lower corner. So here's a few interior views of the main sanctuary. It shows relatively unusual truss work. We had trouble kind of putting a specific name on this form. Um, what's also unusual is that it only has one side aisle. So rather than be like a more symmetrical design, it's sort of that asymmetrical uh, design to the interior. And here we have a view of All Saints Hall on the left and the small chapel space on the lower right. So this is St. Matthias Episcopal Church Complex. Are there any questions on this project? I think it's important to note that the 1963 edition complements the design and the color and the materials and reads really clearly as a 19th, 20th century design piece. It's in. Jim, what was the catalyst for this nomination? Was the congregation uh, there advancing this? Or? The, the congregation is seeking to celebrate, I think, their 150th anniversary, so they're looking for, for recognition for that. Uh, and, why does the period significant end in 1963? That encompasses the addition that was added to the building and sort of completes the story um, in the post-war baby boom era world of the church complex. We will add that. I mean, we, we did yeah. kind of have that in there. Yeah, we'll make sure that's yeah. emphasized. And the, gra the, mix up a bit. the garage is contributing. It is. Any other questions or comments? The, the nomination mentions Roy Croft and the sensitive. So, was there any sense that this was more intentional to really make this, to design this church in a way that is. The, the, the Roy Croft community in East Aurora, yeah. the nomination oh, oh, references that the style you know, kind of ties into it. I would say, it, do we know? I'm just curious. It, we haven't found any specific reference that he was looking specifically at the arts and crafts movement through the Roy Croft campus, but certainly the village of East Aurora in general has embraced sort of the arts and crafts aesthetic um, in many churches and many, you know, buildings. All their signage has sort of an arts and crafts <laughs> image to it. So it was certainly sort of a pervasive community-wide design aesthetic. And the lead architect, Robert North, did have ties to the community and the right yes. yes. part of it. Do you want to hear a motion to accept St. Matthias? Well, well, well. Wint is the first. Anyone second? Lucy? Lucy seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. On to the boarding house. Boy, this is a good one. <laughs> At uh, 72 to 74 Sycamore Street. I've got a really diverse <laughs> <laughs> There are three nominations in, and we're moving from beer to prostitution in the city of Boston. There's a church. There's a church. <laughs> church. <laughs> yeah, the book ends to the church of beer and prostitution. <laughs> Wonderful. Nothing's changed. So the boarding house at 7274 Sycamore Street is proposed under Criterion A in the area of social history as a rare surviving example of a building from Buffalo's Canal era that provided housing for a long and varied series of borders and transients from its construction in the mid-19th century through the mid-20th century. 
Research indicates that it was built as two identical attached dwellings for well-known local courtesan Eliza Park in 1848. During her ownership in the 1840s through the 1860s, the building is believed to have originally served as a brothel on one side and a rental property on the other. According to the 1850 federal census, there were eight women between the ages of 15 and 48 living in the western half of the property with a 38-year-old Pork. In February 1857, Pork paid $1,000 bail on charges of keeping a, quote, disorderly house, and later that year, in October, she paid another $25 fine for the same charge. Census records confirm that the building was used continuously as a boarding slash rooming house under a long series of owners for a century after Pork's death in 1868. Throughout the building's long history, its tenants included working class people such as carpenters, masons, cooks, and actors. It included immigrants and African Americans as early as 1850, in the 1850s. There are also references that describe it as a, quote, body house and, quote, ranch, which are terms for brothel. Uh, mentioned foreclosures, noted the arrests of, of sex workers, described it as, quote, formerly run by the notorious Hattie Lynn, whoever she was and other indications that the building was used in part over time in the sex trade industry. At some point in its history, likely between 1900 and 1905, the buildings were altered, interconnected on the interior with a single opening providing access between the two buildings and to the upper floor with a basement level commercial space added below. The building was raised from two and one half stories to three in the late 19th century, creating additional space for borders. Between 1902 and 1967, every description noted that it was either a hotel, a boarding house, flats, or non-boarding rooms with a saloon. There, were at least, there was at least one citation in the 1920s for running the disorderly house, and additional physical updates for boarding house use in 1948 and 1967. Perhaps more than a century of documented use of this building by some of the poorer, immigrant, and perhaps less respected citizens of Buffalo provide rare and important information about settlement patterns, living conditions, and Buffalo's rapid and changing growth. Architecturally, the building reflects both its early canal era origins and its continued use for a boarding house, retaining its original form, exterior materials, and most of its door and window openings from the original period. Other openings, such as the entrance to the second building and the third floor windows, are clearly visible and interpretable. Four original chimneys and the demising wall in the basement document the original plan. The interior represents the second period when it was redefined as one building. Features that represent this period include the unified plan, central stair, central kitchen on the first floor, one bathroom inserted on each floor, a laundry room in the basement, and multiple bedrooms, as many as 20 as noted in later building permits. So this is the boarding house at 7274 Sycamore Street. Are there questions on this one? It's surprising that the building is substantial as this. It has, uh, at least at present, a rather crummy wooden uh, uh, stoop access. And, and originally, would have also been wood? I mean, there was no sense that it was a masonry entrance? It was most likely wood, uh, as far as we can tell, but that's purely conjectural. This, this project has taken, I would say, the entire National Register unit to <laughs> understand and decode and examine. It's been a very forensic examination. Um, the city of Buffalo didn't start keeping permit, building permit records until the 1890s, so some of this was probably done before that. Some of this was probably done just off the record. <laughs> so um, it's been this has been a thorough examination of this building. And the catalyst for this nomination? Uh, this is a grant candidate. And it's also one of Buffalo's few remaining pre-Civil War buildings. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really the key point. I mean, this type of sort of, for lack of a better term, generic building would have been down every street in the city of Buffalo in the 1840s and then subsequently has been demolished through the city's later growth and urban renewal and there's really a small handful of buildings dating back to this era remaining in the city of Buffalo. You need a neighborhood that needs all that up if you get. Right. Uh, so what, the grant, what, what's the plan for the building moving forward? Is it? Uh, the nomination, it, it has been sponsored by Preservation Buffalo Niagara, which is the regional nonprofit preservation organization out of the city of Buffalo. Um, they are looking to uh, adapt the building, I believe, for use as their offices, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if they have other. Mm -hmm. 
Are they the owner and president, or are they going They to are not. Yeah. And the neighbor burned down. Yes. yes. It, was a lar it was a larger block, and there was a development plan for that, and that fell through when the neighbor burned down. The left burning down, so that's recent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There was a drawing that surmised there might have been two exterior doors in the front. Yes. Is there any physical evidence? Yes. Um, if you look closely, I don't know that I included the photo. Um, I mean, you can see it, it, if you look closely. Is there a notch about me? Whoa. Oh, whoops. Okay. Oh, there's yeah. But there is physical evidence. So, if you look here, you can see the lintel over this door. Yeah. And there's a lot of vines here, but if you look, we have some better photos um, that I think I included in the nomination. But you can actually see the lintel right in front here. So it, was, it wasn't that they were two sort of bookmark, book matched units. It was two side hall units. That's why I did this. You know, we have to compliment Jen for the sketch here for us. <laughs> okay, that's why I created this. <laughs> Well done. Because yeah, we, I, I, it, it's hard to sort of understand the, the physical evolution of this building. And when so. you look at it from the air, you can see the four chimneys. Right. So you can also figure out the plan so that way. The ramps are a little steep. Um, <laughs> just, just, I know. I was just sorry. trying to sketch oh, a little bit. I know. I have my drafting table good. set up. I'll do it. Two-point perspective. No, I'm glad I brought it up. But, um, the great nomination. Yeah. Um, any other comments? Motion to approve this nomination. Second. Uh, Second. Kristen had a first time check. Okay. Wait. Kristen. Kristen moved. Jay seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Thank you. Okay, thank you so well, much. Let me, let me thank. Um, this was a challenging nomination. Uh, and. I just want to thank the staff collectively for their work on this to see a peer review process work uh, as, as well as it did uh, in, in the office was, was great to see, but um, Jen and Kath as well, thank you for a commitment to this, getting this nomination to the board. It has been a pretty intense process. I know it's been frustrating at times, um, uh, and you've, you've pulled it off, so congratulations. Thank you. Bill also was a big help. Yes. But Bill's Bill, drawing was not picked for this. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's drawing didn't quite make it. Oh, <laughs> you also did a drawing. <laughs> Thank you. Get your office competition. It's quite a little charrette. I think we should be able to select. As the yeah. Board. Can we see yeah. that other drawing? I did not <laughs> even <laughs> try to draw the submissions. <laughs> Moving on to East, uh, no, Watkins Glen. First Presbyterian Church of Watkins Glen, I believe, is our next nomination. Yes. And for those new to the board, my name is Virginia Bartos, and I am currently covering the Finger Lakes and Onondaga County for the National Register Program. My first presentation is the First Presbyterian Church of Watkins Glen in Scarlet County. Located on North Decatur Street, the church is significant under Criterion C and Criterion Consideration A for its architecture and for being a design of prominent 19th century Rochester architect A.J. Warner. Designed in 1866 and completed in 1868, the building is in the round arch for Grundbogen. Our, our friend, the Rund Bogenstiel. <laughs> the style recommended by the likes of Richard Upjohn as being suitable for non-Anglican Protestant churches in America. The Presbyterian Church was built directly across from St. James Episcopal Church, which was National Register listed in 2012. It was constructed in 1864 in the Gothic Revival style, and this provides a comparison of these 19th century philosophies of Protestant church architecture. As the author of the nomination points out, the building features round arch stone window and door surrounds, brick corbel cornice on the facade, and flat pilaster style buttresses with stone caps between the windows on the north and south elevations. Other features are the stone foundation, molded stone belt courses, and painted brick corbeling on the north and south. The building is dominated by the corner bell tower that now serves as the main entrance to the building. 
The image in the upper right shows the L that served as a school and a chapel and is now used as a meeting space, nursery, and Sunday school. The lower right shows the north elevations of the L and the church. Pews and windows of the sanctuary reflect a late 1960s remodeling, but the interior retains original features such as the, the arrangement of pews facing the pulpit platform, chestnut wainscoting, curved plaster ceiling, large fluted window moldings, and decorative paneling of the pulpit platform and balcony. The top left image uh, shows the recessed arch in the east end and the flanking arches, along with the door to the L. The image in the lower right shows the balcony with the original, remaining original 1868 pews and flooring left intact during the 20th century remodeling campaigns. And going <coughs> left to right here, we have this is the L, I should mention, and we have the first floor parlor slash library, one of the second floor Sunday school classrooms, and the second floor gymnasium, which is now used as storage space. As mentioned in the nomination, the rear L was originally used as a chapel and school building, with the building's first floor consisting of a large lecture room, two parlors, and an entrance hallway on the south of the section of the building. And this floor is now divided into a choir or a music room, a nursery, and a parlor slash library. The second floor has a gymnasium previously used as an auditorium with a 32 foot high ceiling. And it also has two Sunday school classrooms that originally housed a kitchen. A modern kitchen was added to the basement when a fellowship hall and offices were constructed and more of the basement was dug out in the 1940s. The nominated property includes a circa 1874 manse, which the church has been unable to document as also being designed by Warner. The exterior retains its asymmetrical form and picturesque features that include a bay window on the side topped by a six-sided cap, a doctrine string course between the first and second stories, first floor of length, the first floor length uh, windows in the front and bay windows, and a full width porch across the facade and decorative verge board pendants in the gable lands. The man's interior retains its original layout with rooms off of the central hallway historic staircase, fireplaces, wood floors, doors, and interior window shutters. The sponsor of the nomination is the church, and we have a letter of support from the village of Watkins Glen historian. Great. Questions, comments? All the changes that were made in the three episodes, which still results that they were cosmetic and the original materials are still there, so it's impressive. Absolutely. Do I hear a motion to approve? Sarah? So moved. Second? Second. Erica? All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed to the same? Motion carries, thank you. Moving to Clyde. Moving too fast. Yes. Magic. <laughs> My next presentation is the Clyde Downtown Historic District that was an outgrowth of a 2017 village funded reconnaissance survey. Working with the village, we were able to identify the boundaries of the downtown area that was historically shaped by major transportation routes, including the Clyde River, the Erie Canal, and the New York Central Railroad. The nominated district includes two major roadways known as State Route 414, or Glasgow Street, and State Route 31, known as Genesee Street. And I suppose I should point these out. Let's see. Bringing up the it's what happens when you have a big thumb and you're trying to <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Now, let me try this thing. There. Okay. Uh, 414 and 31. Genesee and Glasgow. Great. You can continue on. 414 follows a Haudenosaunee path developed for travel between Lake Ontario and Finger Lakes, and Route 31 generally follows the West Fork of the Mohawk Trail. A major feature of the district is the historic Washington Square Park, established around 1820. And st the streets surrounding the park contain a cohesive collection of a contiguous mid-19th to mid-20th century commercial and civic buildings, and a smaller number of homes and religious buildings. 
The nominate district is significant under Criterion A for settlement and exploration, transportation and commerce, as well as Criterion C for architecture for its collection of commercial, public, and related residential architecture that illustrate the early history and growth of the community. The image to the right is the 1859 United Methodist Church that is at the extreme northeast corner of the district. Uh, mentioned in the nomination as having its 1871 tall steeple visible from any direction when approaching the village. As I mentioned, the key feature of the nominated district is the circa 1820 public square, later renamed Washington Square Park, also known commonly as just Washington Park. Seen in the upper left is the park in 1850 with its fencing. The park was the starting point for laying out of the streets in the early 19th century. And over the years, it was transformed from a village green to a public park, complete with the fencing removed and gravel paths added, followed by a 1912 bandstand, an 1890 fountain, and a 13-foot tall statue of George Washington donated in 1932 by the local chapter of the Sons of Italy. There are other associated features added over the years that are mentioned in the nomination. The park became a community gathering spot and still is, and the surrounding streets saw construction of important government buildings, churches, and houses of prominent residents. The large 1861 Italian house with the cupola seen in the, in the upper left is on Soda Street at the west side of the park. The house was built for Porter Dennison, the proprietor of the Cloud Clyde Hotel, that was originally at the opposite end of the park. He was also a supervisor for the town of Galen and owned a coal and lumber yard. The historic image to the right shows the home of Dr. G. D. Barrett on North Park Street, who bought the house from the photographer and musician James Muth. The house is seen as it appears today in the lower right image. At the end of North Park, at Soda Street, is the former Baptist Church, which was built in 18. And remodeled in 1877 and is now the Galen Historical Society. And that's this building right here. Across the park on South Park Street by the Village and Town Hall building, constructed in 1964, and the 1940 post office previously listed in 1988. That is just the post office. These two buildings represent the last buildings constructed around the park in the continued government presence, as well as the end date for the period of significance, which is 1820 to 1964. These two are documented architect design buildings. The village and town hall was designed by the Syracuse firm of McKnight, Kearns, and Wilson, known for other municipal buildings constructed mostly in the Syracuse area. The 1941 post office was the design of post office architect Louis Simon and features a mural of the rural canal scene in the interior. Just a few more images of the area immediately around Washington Park. The top image is a building on Soda Street that was one of several residences converted to commercial use, this one being a funeral home. Caroline Street in the lower image has the most, what I call, conversions. The greenhouse is still a private residence, but two former churches just next to it, um, and the former Methodist par parsonage at the corner are now apartment buildings. Glasgow Street seen here developed as the primary commercial street for the village, and the majority of the current buildings were constructed between the mid-19th and early 20th century. The top left image shows the west side of Glasgow Street, and the remaining images are the east side. The one remaining building on Ford Street mentioned in the nomination can be seen behind the large corner building in the upper right. That's this building right here. The commercial buildings in general are largely two-part commercials, and the large one on the corner is the Marley Block. That's this one here. Okay. That was renovated in 1904. The circuit 1850 former Clyde Eagle building right here. Okay. Um, news, the newspaper building marks the nomination boundary for the east side of the street, and uh, it originally was built as a blacksmith shop and served as the newspaper office from 1861 to 1961. Or 1881, rather, sorry. 
The other primary commercial street is Columbia, and I'm struck by the number of saloons, barbershops, and hotels and restaurants mentioned in the resource list, um, no doubt due to the fact that the street faces the canal and the railroad. Like Glasgow Street, the buildings are largely two-part commercials, and another feature that they share with Glasgow is they have several cast iron storefronts that are either locally made or shipped in from Rochester. The historic image shows the same view of Columbia, offering an excellent comparison. The sponsor of the nomination is the Village of Clyde, and the nomination itself was drafted by the Village Code Enforcement Officer and local history expert who stated that he's probably the only person that's been in each side of the buildings in the district. Hmm. Comments, questions? Virginia, can you go back to the original map and sure. uh, show us where the New York State Barge Canal is right now? Well, I can't show you where the Barge Canal is because it's an 1850s map. I can show you where the Erie Canal is. Yeah. This is the Clyde River. This is the canal. Okay. So we don't know if the Barge Canal is. Okay. That same line. Uh, the barge canal, I believe, goes off in this direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think it's significant that the village is championing their own architectural and yes. social history. Yes. Yes. And perhaps we could look to them to help us in whatever we need to do with the power of God. <laughs> <laughs> I would also observe that the form is just written up really nicely. Uh, the methodology section is great. It has great structure uh, in writing and form clarity. Uh, I like the grouping of the uh, street address, date, name, and, and contributing, uh, contributing factors, and then the architectural description, and then the historical context grouped uh, with the individual building you descriptions. Want, you want to tell Doug who wrote this one? Oh, I, I mentioned the, the, the code enforcement officer yeah. for the village. Well, all the nominations that Cat's we got. comment is we'd like to hire him. We'd like to hire him. And I think this form should be used as a model for a, district, for a historic sure. district. I like this one, one of the best. Absolutely. All, all the consultants we work with, the best one was written by the code enforcement officer. Yes, yeah, I really was second that. I was yeah. I had the same note, especially about the little history section. Exactly. It was so it was nice. Really nice. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, yeah. He's, he really does a lot of local history in the community. He's uh, written up. Blackbird signs. He's gotten uh, signs from the Pomeroy Foundation. He's given uh, walking tours. When I was there, they were dedicating monument uh, their signs that they had gotten for the various landings and areas. And he is the one who wrote up all of the descriptions. For me. I think it, a lot of it comes down to writing ability. I mean, that's what I've always, as an English major, I'll say a lot of it comes <laughs> down to a basic writing ability. Uh, is there 60? Primary or 59? 59. I'm, I'm, I'm going to double check that. Kristen pointed it out. Yeah. And before I, I send them on for signature, I always double and triple check the building. Is counts. the bandstand a building? Um. Because that could it, be number 60. I don't think it's a building. Because there's 54 plus the bandstand. You usually plus define five. as if it can uh, hold human habitation, then it's a building. But this one, I'm the form says 60 buildings, one site, and one object. And I presume the, the object is the Washington statue. Uh, the object, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so something to double check. Also, yeah, a code, uh, the, a code official would pick something on the roof that gets to a building. <laughs> Maybe you found people sleeping. Well, also, too, the, when you look at those definitions in Bulletin 16, it's like, okay, I flip a coin. Term definition, uh, I have not encountered the term millinery, M-I-L-L-I-N-E-R-Y. Was it spelled wrong? No, I don't know. What is it? Hats. 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 Just, just say it. Archaeologist, it's okay. Yeah, I, I deal with Arabic. Millinery. I thought it's haberdashery. These are the ones with Okay. Gender hats. Gender hats. Thank you. Uh, any further comments? Do we hear a motion? So, with hand up first, I'll second this since I asked about millionaire. Okay. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Doug, may I comment? I've, I've ridden through this village three times on my bicycle. It's one of the rest stops on the, uh, the parks and trails ride between Buffalo and Albany. And 
you get here late in the day, I've seen a very, very low effort Elvis impersonator playing, uh, singing songs in that, in that pavilion. Um, this is a place that is ready made for the state rehabilitation tax credit program. And it's one of those places. And the federal. It's census tract qualified for the, you know, state credit, for the homeowner credit. Obviously, it's now, you know, by virtue of national register listing, it's now qualified for the federal rehabilitation credit. Um, it's just one of those places in New York that with a little bit of extra investment incentive that we're now, that you're all, you all are now providing through this listing. I just, I think you're yeah. going to start to see some interesting That's investment there. Great. It's a beautiful spot on the canal. We system. have identified a residential uh, area that might be a potential historic district. But talking with the village, we're going to start with this one and then we'll move on. Nicely done. And we really do see um, a lot of those residential credits after these districts are listed. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now, Moving next on. on the agenda is the Paul Vino building. Rochester, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't vote, did we? Did we vote? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Okay. I asked um, myself the same question. Okay. Yeah, this Polvino. is the Pol Polvino building in Rochester, Monroe County. Um, and let me say first before I forget that the Polvino building is a federal rehabilitation tax credit project that received its part one approval in February 2019. Um, the building is a 1925 three-story steel and brick building that was originally housed, that originally housed Anthony Polvino's furniture business and later the undertaker undertaking business he conducted with his nephew. We have kind of a theme here of funeral homes mm -hmm. undertaking. Anyway, it's on an odd-shaped parcel, uh, nearly triangular lot with the building following the lot lines and the image on the right shows the north elevation. The building is significant under Criterion A for commerce and for its connection to the early 20th century Italian community that opened a number of businesses on Central in the Central Park area. And I have to stress Central Park is a street. It's not a park. After nearly 10 years of vacancy, it became an auto repair shop, which had remained until the year 2000, reflecting the post-war popularity of private automobiles. And you don't no doubt notice that there's a break in the period of significance between 18, or 1935 and 1949, which reflects this vacancy. The building is also significant for its commercial design of steel frame masonry with flat rooms, large windows, and ground floor storefronts. The interior is flexible by nature and accommodating, and was accommodating the shift of the furniture to the automobiles with its open floor plan. And the changes that the automobile group did uh, were pretty much limited to the storefronts. So you have a highly intact interior going back to its construction. Um, it also retains historic features such as the pressed tin ceiling, decorative metal fretwork with the elevator, and wood encased metal supports. Um, simple building, but well worth being considered for listing, and also, like I said, we got their part one approval. It's a very well researched nomination. Mm -hmm. I think that it's important to see vernacular buildings like this that have had such an interesting industrial history with the transition in uses Absolutely. from the, you know, the undertakers and the furniture folks to the auto folks and the break of significance in between. So I, I was very enthused in reading this one and, and its support. Is there anything to add about this one? Is, how common is it to break up the period of significance like this happened here? This is the first time in my experience. Yeah. We don't do it that often, but um, it had a very long period. And if it was just a couple of years, I, we wouldn't have it. It had a very long period of sitting empty. But both periods were significant. Right. So we wanted to include them. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked that one from had the furniture and the making the coffins and then the undertaking right in the same building. And then the shift to auto parts, auto parts. but it retains this sort of ethnic identity with Italian. Exactly. Well, it did, but the Italian community moved off. Sure. But and the Italian community holds for the auto parts here. At the beginning of it. Yeah. Because yeah. that's where the shift began. Sure. And it's going to be affordable housing, right? I think so. Good. Affordable housing? Right? Yes. Do I hear a motion to approve the Polvino building? So moved. Carol? Second? Kristen? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed, you're staying. 
much. I'm curious. And <laughs> Park Avenue Historic District, Rochester. Um, this map is from 1926. 2,205 contributing buildings. Yes, but about 1,400 in, I got the number in your summer, uh, primary buildings. So, yeah, it's very densely built out. Um, I've taken this 1926 map and superimposed roughly the, the district boundaries on it just to give you an idea. Um, this rather large district is located to the east of the Genesee River and north of I-490 and is being nominated under Criterion A in the area of community planning and development for reflecting the residential growth of the city following a series of annexations. Um, it also reflects the commercial development of the downtown and, and residential movement from the city center to outlying areas that were openly large tracts, mostly farms and horticultural fields. In 1834, the east boundary of the city was Whitman Street. That's right here. Now, and by the 1850s, the area north of Park Avenue attracted wealthy, a wealthy class that built large estates. And this area was between Park and University, this area right here. Um, it centered around East Avenue. And that was listed in 1979 as the East Avenue Historic District. Okay. As owners of the land south of Park Avenue realized the land value, they subdivided it into tracts, aided by further annexations, such as the one in 1874. And infrastructure improvements, most notably sewers, soon followed. And as the city line crept eastward, so did the development of the Park Avenue area. The nominated district contains 1,462 primary buildings, with the overwhelming majority of them being built as single-family homes. The district is also significant for its collection of mid-19th to early 20th century residential architecture, with several designed by local architects and for its commercial buildings along the south side of Park Avenue, largely built in the early 20th century and with none of them still in use. Uh, uh, a little explanation about the annexations. Uh, you can literally, if you start here, this is where the city line ended in 1834. And like I said, uh, the wealthy were starting to establish some estates up here. Um, just to give you an idea, this is a later one with George Eastman's house up in that section. Okay. You also have the University of Rochester located here. And by the time that this map was made in 1926, you also had a lot of industry locating along the rail lines just outside. Okay. Um, 1926, I believe the canal was filled in by that time and they were starting to use it as a subway. Mm -hmm. But this area, you probably think, well, how does this differ from East Avenue? Well, East Avenue, it does have, you can see the streets here, are a little more spread out. The lot lines are much larger. You don't have the incredible density that you have within Park Avenue. And just by driving around, once you cross over from the south side of Park into the north side of Park, into the East Avenue Historic District, it's, you can, it's very visible to change the difference between these two districts. And my quandary was, OK, we've got this huge number of buildings. How am I going to show this to you? So I decided what I'd do is organize it by the type of building. And I thought I'd start with the commercial buildings. And with the large number of resources, it just seemed the, the uh, obvious thing to do. Uh, we're looking at one park avenue here. Um, there were other important buildings that were located in the district as well, such as the post office, right here. Okay. Um, the library, there was also a library, and these buildings are now have new functions. The hospital is now in Chiva, and the library is now the Mackenzie and Child's shop for the Park Lee, which is a well-known, well-established uh, gift shop, art shop. I love to go there myself. <laughs> it's great. So that's Park Avenue, that part of Park. 
Um, the other thing, uh, one of the commercial buildings is a 1961 architect design office building. And you're thinking, why are we considering this contributing? Well, it reflects the continued commercial status of Park Avenue and falls within the period of significance. The architect for this was Olga Galvana, a local architect, who opened her own firm in Rochester in 1953. The overwhelming majority of the buildings in the nominated district are built as single family residences, and you can visually track the west to east expansion of the area, a smaller number of mid 19th century buildings in the west end, and a larger number of late 19th through turn of the 20th century designs, largely Queen Anne and Colonial Revival in the heart of the district. The American Foursquare is also well represented in the district, and although this discussion is missing from the nomination, we'll work on that. And the large number of similar styles is presumed to be attributed to buildings using common pattern books, um, patterns and pattern books. Some developers and builders seem to allow clients to select designs and accent details. You look this in particular up here. Those who could hired an architect. Here are two of the several architect design houses in the district and a historic image of each. The upper building is 250 Canterbury Road, designed by C. Stores Barrow. The lower two uh, images are 84 Dotman Street, designed by Faye and Dreyer. And I won't bore you with the histories of the architects since these are included in the nomination text. One of the characteristics of the nominated district is the number of apartment buildings scattered throughout. Some of these are on prominent corners along Park Avenue, but not all, such as the Alexander, which is, of course, on Alexander Street. And the apartments appeared shortly after the end of World War I, reflecting the appeal of the Park Avenue neighborhood, the demand for housing, and the appeal of rental versus ownership, especially for those new to the area, and with limited financial resources, which I mean as not having enough money to buy that first house. Two early 20th century Spanish Revival apartment buildings seen here are two of the early apartment buildings. All three of these date from roughly 1950 to 1920. Also making an appearance in the early 20th century was the townhouse, seen here on 26 Wilmer Street. Now, I believe in your document it's being referred to as a row house, and I got a comment back from the Landmark Society that there are no true row houses in this historic district. They're townhouses. So I have altered the nomination text to reflect that. The nomination makes re reference to ecclesiastical and institutional buildings in the district. Uh, I call them what they are, churches and schools. Okay. The Francis Parker School is the only public school in the nominated district with its circa 1920 building designed by J. Foster Warner. And the Blessed Sacrament uh, Church Complex is near the south end of Oxford Street and consists of a 1911 church and a circa 1930 convent and I thought I'd leave you with this slide of individual buildings, mostly located in what are called the A, B, C streets, because they start with A, B, and C as you progress from west to east. Okay. Um, the house in the lower left is a Claude Bragdon design building, and if you know anything about Rochester and Claude Bragdon, you know how important he is. The nomination is sponsored by the Landmark Society of Rochester with funding from the Rochester Area Community Foundation and the Preservation League of New York State and the New York State Council on the Arts. And also, I need to say, with additional funding raised by the neighborhood associations. Okay. So this is the uh, Park Avenue Historic Districts. Comments, questions? It's an impressive nomination, and it's certainly, I, I thought your presentation of the 1960s commercial building mm -hmm. as being significant was noteworthy, and, and certainly it's important. Another nice form in terms of its structure where you start by neighborhoods, then go to streets, then go to landscape features. I thought that was great. A uh, nice property list summary uh, by type. Nice to go. Other comments, questions? Oh, do I hear a motion to accept? So moved. Eric. So moved. That was me. Eric.
Second? Lucy. All in favor? Aye. Stand your vote. So it's worth noting that the census tract is state credit qualified, so the homeowner program and the state tax credit will be available Excellent. for the owner occupied and commercial yeah. properties in the district. All of the city of Rochester is a um, eligible census tract. Uh, there was a, a piece of legislation approved earlier this year that said uh, cities in New York State with a population below 1 million and with a poverty rate of higher than 50%. Entire city is an eligible census tract. So in my territory, that qualifies Elmira and Rochester and Syracuse. Thank you. So 50 or 15? 15. So those are now, irregardless of future census tract changes, other demographic. Um, <clears throat> anyway, those cities are fully qualified for the homeowner program going forward. So. Great. Moving now to Glencoe Mills Methodist Church. Columbia County. The, the left. There's an arrow. You can barely see it on the left. <laughs> Where am I pointing? Point the, the clicker is pointed here. You should be welcome to do the state park. Excuse me, technical difficulties. And Bob, I'm, I'm glad you're here today because I think this is about my 76th meeting or something. And when I started, I remember being absolutely terrified. I still am to appear before this board, oh. and we are still using slides, so things have changed. Uh, Glencoe Mills. Uh, Glencoe Mills Methodist Chapel in Columbia County, being nominated in the areas of architecture and social history, a period of significance uh, from its construction in 1869 until 1940. The Glencoe Mills Methodist Chapel is a wood frame religious building of modest dimensions that was erected in 1869. The exterior exhibits distinctive features that related to the Gothic revival style, among them the steeply pitched roof, diamond pane window sash, and peaked door and window frames. As with the exterior, the interior of the chapel is remarkably intact to the original 1869 building campaign in addition to a later circa 1900 renovation, at which time an elaborate decorative pattern of narrow beadboard was added to replace existing plaster on lap wall and ceiling finish. Also remaining in place are the original slip pews, the raised dais and liturgical center, a 19th century SD harmonium, an original kerosene wall and ceiling fixtures, the latter which have been electrified. The chapel remains a highly intact example of, rural religious, of a rural religious edifice erected in the post-Civil War period, conceived to serve the spiritual needs of a once thriving Columbia County mill hamlet in the town of Livingston. In addition to the chapel, the nomination includes one additional contributing resource, a church hall dedicated in 1940. We have a bunch of that. You see, unfortunately, uh, deferred maintenance has taken uh, a bit of a, has made an impact on the parish hall. The chapel's construction was funded by Isaac Shorman, a Livingston native who, following a successful career in New York City, retired to Glencoe Mills toward the end of his lifetime. Shorman recognized that Glencoe Mills, which by the 1860s was flourishing as a mill seat within a larger agrarian community, lacked a dedicated house of worship to serve its population. Thus, some residents had to travel outside of the hamlet to practice their faith, while others, and the Hamlet's children in particular, which is what Shorman took exception to, failed to observe the Sabbath at all. It was that situation that Shorman sought to remedy and to ensure that his efforts would continue unabated, he not only funded the construction of the building, but he left it a trust. Architecturally, the building's picturesque Gothic stylistic vocabulary and its diminutive scale, it is a very uh, almost bite-sized building, a wonderful gem-like building, mark it as distinctive. While those responsible for its design and construction remain anonymous, it might be surmised that Shorman, a former carpenter, former carpenter builder and later a lumber merchant, took an avid interest in its design and construction. As it stands today, the building is a little altered from its 1860s appearance, save for the reworking of the worship space's original plaster and wall uh, finishes, as we see here. This building is virtually untouched from 1900, it really is remarkable in terms of its physical integrity. 
Most of the building's original or subsequent historic period features inclusive of decorative treatment, slip cues, and lighting fixtures remain in place. It is being nominated in the area of social history under Criterion A, uh, given the circumstances which gave rise to its construction, and additionally in association with Criterion C in the area of architecture uh, as a building erected in a uh, sort of eclectic, picturesque Gothic vein, and that is uh, the Glencoe Mills Chapel. Questions or comments? Uh, I read the following passage, Gothic revival style in a decidedly non-archaeological manner. Yeah, it's, it's occurring at a time where we look at some of the Episcopal churches of, uh, say, Richard Upjohn, which are being drawn from specific medieval precedents. This building, to me, is sort of halfway between a traditional rural meeting house and a little Belco Gothic church. It really is, to my mind, eclectic. I wish we know more about the circumstances that brought about its construction, but we don't. By non-archaeological, I mean it's, it's yeah, as I said, not, not as uh, erudite, perhaps, as contemporary. Thank you. I also had read decidedly eclectic in nature and not precisely definable in stylistic terms, but it has a picturesque Gothic derivation. I agree with you on all of that, but then in your presentation, I thought you nailed it by saying it's an eclectic <laughs> picturesque Gothic. So you may it's, be able to edit a little bit more. Sure, here. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, your, uh, some of your notes, uh, Kat, that forwarded to me. It's, it's sort of a frustrating building to put a tidy descriptor on, I guess, is the, you know, the bottom line. And that, that strange roof appeared in a building in Hudson that we had long thought maybe A.J. Davis had designed, but this is obviously not A.J. Davis, but unusual building. Great. And it's wonderful that you're sending in notes. I do the same thing typically after the meeting, so I expect some, some small editorial comments. It's wonderful. I hope all the board members do that. Yeah. Uh, do we hear? Go ahead. It's, it was so, it's so sweet. It's yeah, it really is. It's a wonderful little thing. Yeah. It's what you want. It's what you want. I call the interior it's like a pottery barn catalog over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll move to accept this one. Does anyone? I'll second. Else? Carol will second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed or stay? Great. Thank you. Amsterdam Free Library? Yeah, so I made a little foray into the Mohawk Valley since we're lacking a reviewer. Um, so the Amsterdam Free Library in Montgomery County being nominated in the areas of architecture and education, the period of significance from 1902, which was when construction was initiated, uh, to 1969 to reflect its continued use uh, as a library. This building uh, is an EPF grant candidate, and thus uh, we brought it uh, today in order to qualify. The Amsterdam Free Library, a Beaux-Arts-style public building located in downtown Amsterdam, Montgomery County, has served an important role in the life of the community since it opened in 1903. The building has three sections, two of which are original. In 1903, two-story main block that faces east on Church Street, which we see images of here, a 1903 two-story west wing, and a 1980 one-story addition behind the west wing. The two original sections form a symmetrical T-shaped footprint, which the 1980 edition augmented. The facade of the principal section is distinguished by its rich Beaux-Arts neoclassical features in a symmetrically composed and characteristic Beaux-Arts fashion. Four composite or limestone columns and four rusticated brick piers frame three large bays with the center bay. The entrance occupying the center bay and of course the iconic inscription opens all. An enclosed entry lined with memorial plaques leads into the lobby where a service desk is located. Behind the desk is the original wood panel that out. And the book lift, excuse me, the book lift used to retrieve books from closed stacks in the basement and second floor of the West Wing. Two large reading rooms, the public principal spaces, flank the enclosed entry. Uh, in June 2017, the building suffered damage from a fire which was largely contained in the front door and second story window. However, associated smoke damage caused more extensive uh, need for repair, let's say, and cleaning. Here we have a view of the entrance floor, of course, the circulation desk. Views of the interior lobby, of course, one of the reading rooms in the bottom right looking uh, into that 1980 edition. 
Uh, the library is significant in association with criterion A in the area of education, given its 150 years of service as a free public library serving the Amsterdam community, and additionally under criterion C as an outstanding example of a Carnegie library which was built to design the firm a fuller and picture of Albany and the Beaux-Arts neoclassical taste. It was constructed during a time when Amsterdam was thriving, at which time it developed the moniker the Carpet City for its nationally known Mohawk Carpet and Bigelow Sanford Mills. The growth associated with its industrial success in turn triggered a surge in population and thus the need for better library facilities. I hope we have his name right. In 1902, Dr. Salfronius French. If anyone has an alternate pronunciation for Salfronius, I'm all ears. Second president of the library, Amsterdam Library Association wrote to Andrew Carnegie requesting grant funding for the purpose of a new library, which was of course granted. In October 1902, the cornerstone was laid, and in November 1903, the building was opened to service. It remains a building of considerable architectural and historic importance to the city of Amsterdam, and one which continues to fulfill the original purpose for which it was conceived and erected. And there's also a view, again, uh, first floor reading room, and then second floor uh, flexible so-called children's space. And that is Amsterdam Public Library. I had a question, which is, do you mean that this is still an emerging building type when it was erected in the city of Amsterdam? Because I think that it would fit. Yeah, that's no, I, I think nationally is as well. Because I think yeah. that in New York State, given that we are familiar with many of the Carnegie libraries that we have in New York City, which are dozens, and it, the period in which they're constructed precedes this and goes beyond it. So if we were thinking about it in terms of New York State, I would not think it could be an emergent building type. That's true. By that time, I think a lot of ideas had been formulated. Yeah. I can't remember the, the publication of the one book on libraries. Um, Very dear book. Yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we can, we can change that. That'd be good. And, and some of this, I, I did not author this. It was more an, an editing job. I'm glad you're familiar with the book, because we rely on it all the time. The comments. Motion to accept. I have a question. Wait, yes, do we know how involved the Carnegie office was in the design of these buildings? Because there were a thousand of them or something, and they all seem to be designed by local people or, or they're all distinctive. But I, I just, I don't know a lot about Andrew Carnegie, but I think that he was sort of a controlling kind of guy, and, and he would not want his money spent foolishly, you know, uh, in bad designs or in bad construction. Did they? Yeah, I don't know the mechanics. I, don't I know think they had to choose the design, but I don't think they actually put the design out there. there. No, I, you're right. I don't think they, 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 there's think no they standard had design. Out. I, I do know that the firms that were hired were firms that were approved by Andrew Carnegie. Were, were approved by so right, but At least in the New York examples, it's yeah. documented in Mary Derrick's book. Right. There were six firms selected, and there were six firms that passed muster. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, the Beaux Arts case was established with McKinley and White's, uh, the Boston Public Library. Um, yeah. And Thank you. Motion to approve. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Great. Thank you. Dan Scarrett Place in Tribes Hill, Montgomery County. Um, really, quite an interesting, interesting <laughs> topic. Um, Kath, uh, let me start doing some research, and then she said it's yours. I said, fine, it's a great, absolutely great building, wonderful building. Early building. Yeah, being nominated in the area of architecture and social history with a period of significance from circa 1795 till circa 1929. I actually think we might extend that to 49. We will revisit that. Uh, it's a candidate for a uh, homeowner uh, tax credit, uh, and thus this, uh, this vote and this listing is, is very important. Danskara Place is an imposing example of eclectic, picturesque domestic architecture located in the Tribes Hill area of Montgomery County. The central feature of the nomination is the ubiquitously named villa, the earliest portion of which was erected for Revolutionary War veteran Colonel Frederick Fisher in the 1790s. And I will say, when I first read this, I did not believe it, but it was entirely confirmed by the physical fabric of the building that it does incorporate that 1795 building into it. So it's pretty remarkable. Around 1870, Vischer's great-great-grandson, Alfred de Graff, oversaw a substantial renovation of the late 18th century dwelling. 
adding those features that transformed it from a vernacular farmhouse of modest lines into a commodious villa of eclectic character with stylistic features drawn from a range of styles, principal among them, the Italian myth. So here we have a historic view uh, on the left, obviously, looking west uh, towards the east elevation. You can see this was a, a pretty uh, substantial uh, gentleman's estate in the post-Civil War period. And on the right, a contemporary image uh, showing the, the south or riverfront elevation, which would face the Mohawk. And again, a historic uh, depiction of the building and, and a contemporary view as well. Other 1870s features include a front-facing cross gable of finial truss projecting bay window with deep bracketed cornice and decorative window lintels. Inside, Dennis Garrett Place retains ample evidence of its picturesque architectural reinvention by de Graff, including a broad hall with new staircase and a large and well-lighted dining room and parlor, both with fireplaces and decorative plasterwork. A 1980s rehabilitation campaign sought to reverse or otherwise restore changes made during the 1950s, at which time the dwelling was converted into a parking units. A wing added as an aspect of that work replaced an earlier kitchen L. It was later badly damaged by fire and has since been removed, leaving only the brick main block. In addition to the house, the nominated property additionally includes a large carriage barn and a stone out kitchen that likely dates to the late 18th century. I will point that out on the right. It actually does have a Dutch type jamless fireplace inside, so it seems pretty clear uh, it is an 18th century construct. Uh, upper left, we see the wing, which actually had just been removed uh, when I visited the site a few months ago. Uh, there was no saving that. It was, um, it was just derelict and burned and exposed to the weather for quite some time, and uh, the carriage part as well. It was Alfred de Graff who oversaw the renovation of his great-great-grandfather's house, adding those features that transformed it from a simpler brick farmhouse into the dwelling that remains today. Colonel Vischer, an important figure in the Mohawk Valley during the tumultuous, tumultuous years of the Revolution, resided during his lifetime in the 1790s dwelling. Its construction followed the destruction by fire of the family's earlier house during the Mohawk Valley raids of 1780. And it was said that the footprint of that even earlier house was still visible in front of the larger villa up until probably a generation ago. And maybe archaeology was, I don't know at this point. At one time, the property included 1,000 acres of associated land, a portion of which was successfully cultivated, which later in the post Civil War evolved into a gentleman's farm under the Graf's auspices. Again, some interior details two fireplaces in the dining room and parlor, this wonderful staircase, and this house has these exceptional built-in bookcases uh, in the second floor library. It's a view of the second floor landing and you have the right uh, one of the front uh, second floor um, bedrooms. The house is being nominated in association with Criterion C in the area of architecture as an intact specimen of picturesque villa architecture that formed the reinvention of an existing dwelling and under Criterion A in the area of social history for its long association with the, individual, uh, with the influential Vischer de Graff family. There's the extent of our imagery. So it's Dan Scarra Place. A young couple has bought this and are going to make the plunge. Wow. So I think these tax credits are going to come in handy. I was going to say, who I admire their ambition. It's clearly a significant resource. It's, yeah. it's pretty remarkable. Like I say, when we first saw it, we, we said, there, there's no early house, but um, you can see the Dutch cross bond, yeah. molded brick water table, the framing, it is clearly is exactly what they said. And I, we also didn't believe somebody was going to live there, <laughs> a young couple. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no age. Yes. And that's Dan Scarifus. Jay Hoops, second. Kristen, all in favor? Uh, Any opposed or abstain? Thank you. Is that dark? Yes, a great nomination. I hope you agree. A national level? Yes, we believe national level significance, which we think we can fully justify. Mm -hmm. So this is a Richard Pusick dark house and studio in the suffering vicinity of Rockland County, uh, being nominated in the area of art in direct association with Richard Pusick dark, who is uh, obviously depicted here in this photograph period of significance uh, from 1959 to 1992, which reflects his occupancy. And we think as we've demonstrated here, 
that the artists continue to create relevant work during this time here. And we've also gone a step beyond, although an abstract painter, that the setting itself of the building had an impact on his work. The Richard Pusset Dart House and Studio served as the home and studio of renowned first generation American abstract expressionist painter Richard Pusset Dart between 1959 and his death in 1992. As I work through these slides, I wanted to put these two up by way of context. That's the famous 1950 photograph, the Irascibles. There's Mr. Pusset Dart standing here, Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko. This was, um, they were named the Irascibles because they were protesting the exhibition policies of the Metropolitan Museum of Art at the time, which was not um, favoring uh, modern art. <laughs> Uh, and the painting on the right from 1941-42 is uh, Symphony No. 1, The Transcendental, uh, dating from the early 1940s. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's really one of the pieces that put Pusadar on the map in the world. The building was originally erected as a carriage house and chauffeur's quarters of Valley Head Farm, a large country estate developed by the McKinney family. In 1959, the carriage house and associated features were purchased by Bruce Dart, who lived and worked there from that point until his death. It is a commodious building of stone construction that exhibits character-defining features of the arts and crafts style, perhaps with some neoclassical undertones. Inside, it combines spaces originally reserved for vehicle storage with domestic spaces that were used by McKinney's service staff and later by the Bruce Dart family. The artist's studio occupies a large open area on the upper story and it remains much as the artist knew, knew it and worked in it. And here on the bottom we see a period picture with the artist uh, sitting on the bottom right and uh, as we see in the upper image that is uh, how the studio looks today. So it's one of these places you can walk into as though the artist has just stepped out. It is really uh, incredibly authentic to that period, just some general views. The artist studio occupies a large open area in the upper story. Uh, excuse me, I read you that. In addition to the house and studio, the property contains other features, including a stone gardener's cottage with an attached greenhouse and concrete wall planting beds. The setting retains a high degree of physical integrity and continues to convey historic period conditions. Now, as I move through the rest of my um, prepared remarks, I want to say that, and, and I'm going to ask Jonathan uh, Hyman to speak in a moment on behalf of the Pusset Dart Foundation, but a lot of content in this nomination was generated specifically during this process. Both the recollections of his two children, as well as some observations made by Charles Duncan were, were part of this process. So we feel very proud that we were able to pull all this material together uh, during the course of this project. Uh, I just want to point out uh, downstairs a uh, living area, as well as space originally used in the bottom left for vehicle storage, which is now, as you can see, serving an archival function. Nominated property now partially serves the needs of the Richard Pusset Dart Foundation and remains under family ownership. Richard Pusset Dart lived and worked for over 30 years here. He resided with his immediate family and worked in a dedicated studio space where he produced paintings, drawings, sculptures, and photographs that brought him considerable artistic accolades. Although he lived and maintained a studio space outside of New York City, thus distancing himself, from the New York School, of which he was an important part, he was by no means isolated. Visitors included fellow artists such as Mark Rothko, as well as students and guests of the family such as Burgess and Meredith. The nominated house, studio, and setting retained considerable physical integrity to Pusset Dart's historic period of occupancy, and as such, they accurately chronicle the mature stages of his influential artistic career. It is thus a site of considerable importance to the field of American 20th century visual art and one of the pioneering figures of mid-century abstract expressionist painting in this country. Uh, his work is maintained in major collections uh, in America as well as uh, elsewhere. And these were two paintings um, which were specifically chosen uh, by the Pusset Dart Foundation to show that the setting, in fact, did have an influence on his work. Uh, dance of, uh, of Earth, and, Earth and Stars, I believe, late 1980s top painting, which I believe is in the collection of the White House. And the bottom painting is Ramapo Mist, dating from 1975. As the children indicated, this was a place um, from which he drew significant inspiration um, 
that is clearly reflected uh, in his art. Uh, Jonathan, can I invite you perhaps to uh, say a few words? Sure. I'm going to multitask and take a picture of what you're doing. Mr. Chairman, committee members, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Hyman. Uh, I have been deeply involved in this process. And as uh, Mr. Krattinger said, uh, one of the most beautiful and really enlightening things to come out of this nomination is not just that this is a living, breathing house in a, in a living, breathing environment uh, where Richard Pusik Dart had, quite literally, 20 footsteps from his house, the Mawa River. And in fact, that bottom uh, painting illustrates pretty much exactly what the path of the river takes uh, right outside the back door. And as you probably have read in the nomination, uh, and, and I'm going to read a letter on behalf of the, the uh, executive director of the Richard Bousset Dart Foundation, that um, Bousset Dart's use of the property, his enjoyment of the property, and his understanding of the nature around the property is and was inextricably connected to the way in which uh, these natural qualities of the landscape were directly connected to the way he thought about art, directly connected to the way he thought about it, indeed himself. And uh, it really is just a wonderful synergy. Um, uh, many years ago, I became friends with John, Jonathan, John Pusitart, who said his own career as a performing musician uh, in the right through the 70s and through the mid 80s, he was uh, the leader of a band called the Pusat Dart Band. You may or may not have heard of that band. For those of us who were kind of age in the mid, early to mid 70s know that he had a couple of hits and was, uh, in, in, on many occasions, the warm up act for the Rolling Stones and other stadium, uh, uh, stadium acts. His sister Joanna has a reputation of her own as a well-known uh, abstract painter, uh, I've come to know uh, John over, the, over, the, over a decade, I've known him as a friend, and, uh, through, and, and through my own experience as a documentary photographer, I've uh, kind of stumbled into uh, documenting land use issues and things like that. So a lot of things came together, but um, I was able to coax, and it's in, it's in the application, I was able to coax out of Joanna and John some very intimate details about their father's use of the property, and again, the way in which he combined um, a number of things into his artwork, including uh, Richard Pusset Dart's own um, notion of, uh, of con and connection spiritually to the cosmos. And this picture, and you can see that the stars above the Ramapo House uh, in the Suffolk, New York area are really terrific, and you can see in this painting above, as uh, Mr. Crabger said, in the collection of the White House, you can see that he uh, often makes reference to uh, the natural landscape and or the, uh, the cosmos, in fact. So uh, if, if it's OK, I'd like to read into the record a letter of appreciation and some comments by uh, Charles Duncan, as I said, the executive director of the foundation. And it's addressed to uh, our Daniel McKay. Uh, dear Mr. McKay, on behalf of the Richard Busset Dart Foundation, I would like to thank the New York State Board for Historic Preservation for considering the nomination of the Richard Pousset Dart House to the National and State Registers of Historic Places. The Foundation believes the house is historically significant and as iterated quite cogently in the materials combined, uh, compiled in the detailed nomination presented to the Board uh, today by Historic Preservation Program Analyst William Grattinger the Pousset Dart House meets the criteria for designation. We thank Mr. Krattinger for his dedicated and insightful work in carefully and sensitively, uh, and we say sensitively because Pousset Dart's children are very private people, despite uh, John Pousset Dart's career as a public figure, these are private people. So uh, the foundation and the family wishes to express its uh, sincere uh, appreciation for the the sensitivity uh, and the way the nomination is handled. Um, Mr. Kratcher has uh, illuminated now an architecturally beautiful historic house and property 
are inextricably connected to a modern master's mature vision and artistic output. The nomination application illustrates the following. Detailed architectural descriptions of the house, the historical record of Richard Pusetdar's life and career, statements by his children, Joanna, Jonathan, as well as myself. I'm reading for Charles Duncan. And it illustrates overall how Richard Pusetdar was an innovative and enormously important figure within mid-century American art. By choice, Pusetdar became a singular voice by utilizing the house and property north of New York City to isolate himself from what he saw as the many distractions of big city life. Thus, the Pusset Dart House afforded him the ability to embrace the quietude and natural surroundings as a locus for art making. Of the house, property, and studio, still, as Mr. Krattinger pointed out, much as it was when Pusset Dart died in 1992, uh, Mr. Krattinger states, quote, the house and property on Havistraw Road in Suffern, New York, is the preeminent historic resource that chronicles the life and career of American 20th century artist Richard Pusetdar. His residency there spanned over 30 years and corresponded with the mature phase of his artistic career, during which time he continued to build on his initial successes of the early 1940s. The artist is today re widely recognized as one of the pioneering figures in the abstract of the American Abstract Expressionist Movement and the New York School, a legacy confirmed by the retention of his work in major institutions in the United States and abroad. Finally, it is the uh, intention of the Richard Pousset Dart Foundation to operate and present the Pousset Dart House as a living, breathing link to the artist's life and artistic legacy, one that will provide education and enjoyment for generations to come for those who appreciate art, nature, history, and as Pusetdar did, contemplate thought. Uh, concurrent with this mission, the Richard Pusetdar Foundation may consider an artist in residency program as part of its future, uh, future programming. Sincerely, Charles H. Duncan, Executive Director, and on behalf of the family and the foundation, I thank you again for considering this nomination today. Thank you so much. One quick thing, I'm going to give you a copy of the letter. I hope so. And um, additionally, if, if I get the appropriate or correct email address, we'll send you a PDF so you have it electronically. Right at the end of the scan. Thank you. Motion to approve. Uh, I just would like to, Thank you. Uh, as one of the board historians, I'd like to add an historical note. Uh, I'm very positive about this nomination. Uh, a good many years ago, uh, the artist widow uh, came to see me, described this property, I had not seen it, and said, uh, the family is very interested in state acquisition as a state historic site. And I was sort of taken aback. I mean, I, I didn't know that much about, I knew the name only, and, uh, and I knew very well that the state was not uh, uh, eager to acquire any more of state historic sites at that point. Uh, and uh, but I referred it to others, and the Palisades Park Commission and uh, our office uh, politely replied and, and wished her well. Uh, at about the same time, the family of Arthur B. Davies, another very significant artist in uh, Rockland County, uh, and the family of Henry Gordon Poor, another distinguished artist uh, in the valley, uh, both of whom were dead. Uh, approached the state and saying could their furnished houses and and uh, studios uh, be considered for acquisition or protection in some form. Mm -hmm. they, they got the same answer. I can't tell you how pleased I am that this particular property is clearly come into safe harbor mm -hmm. and uh, I would be very happy to nominate its uh, listing on the register. I have a second. Would you, would you like to say something? No, no. Carol, do you want to come? No, no. Christy's got it. Okay, All in favor? Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I feel like we've fallen a little behind, and I'm probably largely to account for that
Yeah. Uh, one final proposal, the Washington Avenue Corridor Historic District in the city of Albany, Albany County, being nominated in the areas of architecture and community planning and development with a period of significance from 1810 to 1975. Uh, this project was funded by the Preservation League uh, through a grant. Uh, the documentation was prepared by Christopher Brazi on behalf of the historic Albany Foundation. The district encompasses 286 contributing buildings, one contributing site, 17 non-contributing buildings, and seven individually state and national register listed properties. And we have our district boundary. And if, if you know this area, it's, it's, it really always moves from east to west. It doesn't move the other way because you're sort of funneled up through Washington Avenue, and then the old turnpikes begin to radiate outwards, and that accounts for the displayed nature of the district uh, on its west side. The district was developed and redeveloped steadily over the course of the 19th and much of the 20th century, resulting in an architecturally diverse urban environment. The area's building stock ranges from modest one-story wood frame houses to high-rise steel and glass business towers. The architectural styles of those buildings reflect similar diversity in period, style, and use, yet at the same time they form a cohesive entity, particularly when viewed in their historic context. And the bottom image is, is a good sort of microcosm of the district uh, on Central Avenue. We see on the end a, a early 19th century brick federal style building that was once part of a much larger row. Adjacent to that, a later neoclassical building than the very uh, robust Italian of the Helms Brothers Furniture Store. So we get a sense of just the, the, the diversity and the sort of unusual character of this district in, in terms of the way it developed and as it presents today. The period of significance begins in 1810, the date of the earliest building, which actually is the Fort Orange Club at the top mm -hmm. on Washington Avenue, which was later turned into a club. It was once a um, freestanding house, possibly by Philip Hooker, and roughly a dozen years after Albany became the permanent capital of New York State in 1797. The latter year also corresponds with the opening of the Albany and Schenectady Turnpike, which was closely followed by the opening of the Great Western Turnpike two years later. Both of those important overland transportation routes had their eastern termini at their intersection with Washington Avenue, which forms the principal arterial within the district. Traffic along those turnpikes and the commerce they helped create spurred the first wave of developments in the neighborhood. Favorably situated as Albany's gateway to the lands that beckoned for settlement to the west, the district area experienced steady growth and physical evolution over the course of subsequent decades. Uh, image on uh, Swan Street on the top of uh, what was at one time a sort of unified Greek Revival row that, as we see, some have been changed later, some remain largely as built. Uh, some other views along Washington Avenue, again giving you a sense of the general character uh, the Walter Merchant House in the top left, which was individually National Register listed. Some characteristic row housing types, uh, Greek Revival and Italian, and also some later freestanding houses, I believe on Western Avenue on the bottom right, in a sort of vernacular Queen Anne idiom. The district encompasses a significant concentration of civic, commercial, and educational buildings framed by and interspersed with urban housing, portraying the growth and development of the area from the later 18th century into the 1970s. During that period, Albany was transformed from its provincial origins into the capital of one of the nation's most populous states. The district was one of the first areas to be developed outside of the old colonial fortifications, so in that way it's contemporaneous with the Pastures area and also Oliver Hill, and the first on what would become known as Capitol Hill. Again, uh, on the right, another picture of that block on Central Avenue we saw, and then on the left, one of the more architecturally distinguished buildings, uh, steamer number one firehouse uh, by the architect Ernest Hoffman, uh, rendered in a sort of Richardsonian Romanesque uh, vein. It includes the initial sections of three of Albany's most important east-west thoroughfares, Central Washington Western, Western Avenues, which widened and separate as they progressed westward through the city. The district's unusual juxtaposition of resources is the result of the intersection of two different street plans, the rapid development of resources along the corridor, and the westward progression of the corridor over time. It is significant under criteria A in the area of architecture for its many notable examples of public 
commercial, educational, religious, and residential architecture, and additionally under Criterion A in the area of community planning and development. And the district's period of significance extends to 1975 to encompass the redevelopment of Lower Washington Avenue in the early 1960s and 70s. Uh, and we do feel, I should note, we had um, uh, just worked on some updated context for the downtown Albany Historic District that justifies bringing the state of uh, the period of significance into the mid-1970s. We still feel that that area of this nomination is deficient and really needs to be beefed up to justify. So that is, that is uh, we are aware of that deficiency. Right. More, uh, just quickly, um, just some more representative views, uh, including PS12 by Fuller and Pitcher, who we just saw in Amsterdam, and of course the New York State Teachers uh, Campus, uh, with its wonderful array of neoclassical and colonial revival buildings, and one of our favorites, of course, the White Tower Restaurant. A wonderful uh, Art Deco idiom. And uh, one of our uh, aforementioned modern buildings by Julius Taus uh, on the bottom. And that is the Washington Avenue Corridor Historic District. We have four notarized objections. We have one not notarized objection. And we have one letter of support. That's How big are the lots that are objecting? <laughs> <laughs> small, very small. Good. Uh, another nice write up of the Historic District. Questions and comments from the. So I, I always like to know what the objections are about. Yeah, the objections are, are, are uniform in that there's a fear of regulation, there's a historic resources commission, there's a fear of an overlay district and regulation. That is the typical, in this instance, specific. And the, the 1970s structures, we've already you know, you know, Yeah, very much appreciate. So do you mean that you don't need a little more research done? Or a little yeah, bit we need to provide, yeah, for the, for the context of the underlying, you know, right. the substrate, you know, and, and what's interesting is, you know, and, and I thank Tony Opalka, who, is of our office and also the Albany historian who assisted me. You don't even have to show Tony a building. You say 289 Washington Avenue, and he knows exactly what you're talking about. That's so pretty remarkable. But I think one of the ironies is that some of these modern buildings took away buildings which at the time were viewed as big preservation losses. So I think people now look at these and say, wow, that's historic. I remember fighting against that. But it's, it's this the time is moving forward, and we have to look out for it. This, this proposed district is a real hole in the donut in the in the National Resource or uh, the National Register um, uh, landscape in in Albany, and it's it's long overdue. And I'm so pleased to see it. I want to recognize for the record that the league's headquarters at 44 Central is within the proposed district, but that property is already National Register listed, and so therefore there is no conflict of interest for Jay voting uh, in this upcoming matter. And I'll point out that the uh, Albany offices of the Department of State are at 99 Washington as well. Fortunately, you don't own them. It's a real Neither does court. the Department of State. Neither does the State. It's a, it's a very worthy uh, I'm happy to win this. I walk my dog in the district. She likes it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. What, what well, a great well, well, ringing yeah. endorsement. <laughs> Second. Would someone like to second? Second. Eric. Eric. All in favor? Does that mean you've left your mark one? <laughs> of standard <laughs> that one there. Yeah. All right, now we're going to power through the next two. We have a lunchtime presentation to do. So, Chris Flagg is going to lunch. Chris Flagg is going to talk during lunch, so we'll get through these next two. I'm asking everyone to grab lunch and bring it back into this room. And uh, I think these are those. Last two, I feel like I should apologize to Bob that we have no Long Island properties, but unfortunately Jennifer Bettsworth produced a son this time instead of nomination, so she's not here. <laughs> a beautiful son. Um, left one? This one. There you go. Wait. The other way. Did you go back? I think you're going back. The other one. Yeah. Is it the left or the right? Yeah. Central Mutual, 
which I think began there as a regional company in the 1940s and has since expanded. Um, and the company has a very large colonial Bible campus just outside the village limits. This little house proved to um, have a more interesting history than we thought it did at first. It's significant under Criterion C as a distinctive intact example of Italian A style domestic architecture in the village and under Criterion A in the area of commerce for its later success as a popular local hotel and perhaps a boarding house for, for the Evanston community, particularly during the railroad era in the period 1889 to 1910. It was built in, 1960, in 1868 for Dr. William Spencer, uh, son of one of the town's pioneers, Spencer was the village's first doctor and a prominent citizen who served a number of terms as, a town, as the town supervisor. Now he had built an earlier house on the same site in the 1850s, and that house burned in a massive fire in 1867, but he seems to have rebuilt almost immediately because he was uh, soon listed at the same address only a few years later. And he continued to live and work in the new house until his death in 1879. Uh, Spencer's house consisted of the main block that you see here, and it embodies the classic features of the, Ita of the Italian style, as interpreted in little towns like Edmiston. The square form, flat roof, symmetrical fenestration, the cornice brackets, cupola, full with a porch across the front, ear, window, and door frames. And you might not be able to see it here, but there's a door on the side elevation, um, which probably accessed the doctor's office. So after Spencer's death, it went through a few owners, including a, a prominent local carpenter, before the hotel period commenced about 1890, and that's when references to its um, owners as innkeepers in census records and other sources began. And so in 1898, the addition that you see to the left was added, along with some interior renovations, such as additional washrooms and other things. And interestingly, it was in 1889 that the O.W. Railroad extended one of its branch lines from New Berlin to Edmonton, <coughs> where it ran about a half mile south of the village to a site where there was a giant creamery, a fairly large railroad station, and a turntable, since this was the end of the line. The arrival of the railroad sparked considerable commercial growth in Edmonston, and especially in agriculture. And this was the period in which the milk run and the production of cheese and butter was so important in these uh, yeah, rural areas of New York. So in the 1900 census, um, the Rutherford House started, um, was listed as having three boarders, which is somewhat different from having hotel guests. And coincidentally, the second floor of the annex has three small bedrooms. Um, and we were speculating they may have, may have been railroad workers, but we don't know for sure. But the building remained in hotel use under several different owners until 1910. And the building pictured on the 1910 Sandborn map shows it almost exactly as it is today. After that, um, data became a funeral home for a long time, another appropriate use for a large, elegant home, and then a private home until recently, and is about to become the new home to the Evanston Public Library. So the interior um, retains its original plan with a few alterations to accommodate new uses and most of its original details, again with some updates during the hotel period. This is um, Well, this is the um, parlor to the right of the um, entrance on the first floor. And then on the left, we have a double parlor um, with these columns. This is perhaps from the hotel period. And the first room is probably where Dr. Spencer's office was. And of course, it looks perfect for funeral home as well. And then this is in the annex. And you see an exterior window that became part of the interior. And also in the annex, this is the first floor. Um, this is, it was one large room and three small bedrooms above and the beaded board and the bar are probably 20th century. And then the bar, which dates, um, that dates from Dr. Spencer's first 1850s house. And this was used for um, guest carriages during the hotel days. And then finally, a historic view. And this had to be taken after 1898 because it shows the annex and before 1910. 
um, when the Sanborn map showed the building in this configuration. So it's definitely during the hotel period. And you see that the porch had not yet been extended around the side elevation. And here you can see the door I was referring to that presumably led to Dr. Spencer's office. Everything else is virtually as you see it today. Edmondson had three hotels on the street at the turn of the century. This is the only one to survive. It's also one of the village's largest and most sophisticated residents, and it's associated with a prominent local citizen. It's extremely intact and represents several important local themes. Any questions about the Rutherford House? Motion to accept. All right, we have a tie here between Jay and Kristen. Don't go too fast for the secretary now. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed to abstain? Great. Thank you. And the last one today, this is the first Presbyterian Church of Deposit. And this building is literally located in two counties, as the line between Broome and Delaware uh, runs right through the building itself, in, which made me have to nominate or have to notify two whole sets of officials. <laughs> This church is significant under Criterion C as a distinctive and exceptionally intact example of late 19th century religious architecture in the region that illustrates changes in Protestant worship and architecture in the last quarter of the 19th century. Constructed in uh, 1880, this is the third church built for this congregation, and it has a simple cross gable plan that created four identical elevations. As you can see the back, there are two small additions, one on the right there and one coming right off the rear elevations. Um, these were for fellowship and session rooms and both were added before 1900. And surprise, there's a nearly identical church next door that I didn't know about in time to ask if they want to be included. That was constructed for the Baptist congregation in the same year. And both of the churches were designed by Lawrence B. Vaugh, a Brooklyn architect and a very important designer of Protestant churches nationally. The two buildings feature almost identical exterior plans and similar overlays of Victorian and Gothic-inspired decoration. The forms play off each other just a bit, where one is recessed, the other projects, and vice versa. Um, and I don't know, um, but I'm dying to find out, if it has a complementary interior plan. Lawrence, this is jumping. Lawrence Bach um, specialized in auditorium plan churches, a topic he covered thoroughly in his book, The New Form of Plan for Churches in 1873. Although the auditorium plan based in the 18th century in America had caught on to Protestant congregations in the 19th century because it furthered the goals of the revival movement, which promoted the individual conversion experience. As such, churches were supposed to be comfortable buildings that engaged the senses and increased the opportunities for an emotional commitment to salvation. Architects such as Vaughan translated these ideas into form. Vaughan claimed to have invented the auditorium plan, or at least codified this specific version of it. And there's a great, great quote from his book um, wherein he declares his purpose. Churches are built for the salvation of souls, not for the architectural display to the sacrifice of comfort, of acoustic lacking in cheerfulness, and the very essentials to make religious worship a matter of pleasure. We see around us what may be called dead churches, with no working power in them, simply because the form of the building itself is more at fault than anything else. Some are dark, dismal, and gloomy, some overloaded with ornament and stained glass, some on the old cathedral plan, cross-shaped with naves and aisles, high-peaked high roofs supported by columns, obstructing the view of chancel or platform, and the main essential, the comfort of the audience, entirely lost sight of. So Vaughan proposed a plan that would counter the, the dead weight of those old churches by ensuring the greatest comfort for each member and the highest style of beauty. The exterior designs of box churches were an eclectic bunch, but the plans were virtually identical, defined by corner entrances, half-round plans, circular seating, sloping floor floors, radiating aisles, low platforms, and soft, indirect lighting, all in the service of giving each participant equal access to the minister and creating the perfect opportunity for the religious experience. So here we're looking, um, here we're looking, um, 
through one of the corner entrances. And this church is unusual. I haven't seen this before. It has a carved transom and it actually has um, words on it, which I can't remember. And this is looking from the platform. This is my favorite view of this one. This is looking from the platform back. And you can see how the corner entrances provide access into an open, unobstructed, serene space under the soaring, um, groin vaulted ceiling. Now the photographer had a hard time capturing the volume, so I'm just taking you around the side. Um, notice the curved pews and notice how the cross gable form also contributes to the open, unobstructed interior by giving every seat an equally good view of the minister. This one has a very elaborate platform, three levels with multiple uh, serpentine curves. And here's just a detail that you can see the levels going up. And this church uh, cost $1,000 more than the Baptist church, and perhaps because it had this large window, um, which the other ones lacked. And note the muted ge geometric pattern. Unlike a typical stained glass window, this glass was intended to create an atmosphere rather than teach a lesson. This is the session room edition, and this is the fellowship hall, which was a few years later. And finally, this is an historic view that shows, you can see both churches, and you can see the steeple on this one, which was for some reason taken down in 1941. And this is the fifth De Delaware County Presbyterian Church that we've nominated that received an auditorium plan in the 1880s or 90s. Three of the others had new plans installed into much older buildings, and the fourth, like this one, constructed a whole new building. All four of the other um, congregations were of Scottish descent, but this one didn't seem to be. However, they were all older congregations um, which seemed to be turning away from the very strict Calvinist-inspired Presbyterianism that all the other congregations in the regions followed. So any questions about this church? This was a great discovery that Falk had actually designed it, and um, I hope you enjoyed the pictures of some of those other churches that I put in the nomination. And that great quote. That's that quote was yeah. great, right? <laughs> the dead old churches. Motion to approve. Lucy? I will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstainer opposed? Okay, now we have lunch next, and this is a working lunch because we're going to have a presentation. Dan, do you want to make a brief announcement first? Um, I just want to um, uh, acknowledge to, not, not to hammer on this theme, although we look forward to correcting it, um, the NR unit is, is, is producing great results in an understaffed situation. And um, uh, obviously exacerbated by, by um, family leave and such, but I, I just want to thank Kat, you know, Kat, you as, as the unit uh, leader and, and the staff that made presentations today for just enduring uh, and continuing to produce quality work uh, under uh, you know, consistent deadlines, uh, very high level of scholarship. Um, I, I just appreciate that. We, we know the circumstances that you're that you're faced with, and, and I think you're handling it um, quite appropriately and, and usually with great attitude. Um, so thank you for that. Um, thank you for saying that. You're welcome. Your, you're welcome. Thanks. I want to in turn compliment the staff who were really champions this time. It was yeah. sort of like a mash unit, but real teamwork. And, and for those who are in the audience who are unable to, to stay through lunch, uh, the lunch presentation, um, you know, paradoxically, as already been acknowledged, we, we had no Long Island nominations. We quite typically do. Uh, there's been a fascinating diversity of nominations off Long Island from governmental complexes to African American burial grounds and, and 20th century nominations, such as the Sam's nomination that uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, we. We treat your Long Island nominations with the same care and deliberation as you saw today for, for the rest of the state. Um, and um, just as a, as a final acknowledgement of process, over 2,600 properties uh, unanimously endorsed for state register listing today. Uh, they will be listed on the state register over the next few weeks as nominations are presented for my signature and then will advance to the National Park Service for national register uh, consideration. So. Um, well done. Thank you. Yeah. And if you haven't picked up the chart over there, there are charts that kind of list them all with the numbers on them. Okay.
Now, final order of business, since we're going to break for lunch and have a tour following that, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting now, because I think we're probably going to split up and go our separate ways. Moved by Wint. Wint, second motion. Second. Lucy beat you to it. All in favor. Aye. Any opposed to adjourning? Who was it, Wint? Wint and Lucy. So, Gina, thank you so much for hosting us.